Our story is impressive in its scope and multi-layered. It begins as an ordinary story of a long time ago, when the world was at peace. In the kingdom, people lived peacefully and happily, and in an unbroken succession over many generations, the throne was passed from father to son. But a curse from hell came to earth from long oblivion. The demon from the underworld began to speak. The fierce axe in my right hand will remind the people of our power. From the staff which the demon held in his left hand struck lightning. The demon king going into battle ordered his army to conquer the kingdom. Numerous army of demonic corpses began to execute the order, destroying all life in its path. People have forgotten ancient history, so they did not know that they were facing a great battle and their army was not ready for such a battle. The humans fought furiously for days and were still defeated. But as luck would have it, there was an unknown hero who would not back down and waved his sacred sword over the corpses of his comrades. The hero tirelessly killed demons, thus guarding the main entrance to the kingdom. Meanwhile, he thought that the enemies are not only afraid of numerical superiority, but apparently they are served by some dark forces. When he saw that the eastern sky darkened and thunder rumbled beyond the horizon, he realized that the Dark Horde had already killed almost all the knights. At that moment, the hero realized that the demonic army could only be defeated in one way. He dared to attack the demon king, and in the battle he broke his sacred sword, which was deeply embedded in the demon's chest. The demon king on his last cold breath ordered his army to continue the war. But the demonic horde resembling clots of night shadows was no longer such a threat, and soon the humans leveled it to the ground. The demon king who went to war against the humans lost. The hero who defeated the demon leader sacrificed himself and saved the world. But the demon king didn't die. He just went underground and fell into slumber. One day he'll come back. I can't help but say that cliche you've heard a thousand times. Peace returned to the land. The hero became a legend. Boring. I have no idea who wrote it. But until the demon king is not finally destroyed and not uprooted, all the roots of evil complete victory over the enemy is impossible. So the story of the demon king and the hero repeats itself over and over again. The following action takes place in the present time in an underground demonic kingdom. The subordinate breathing heavily ran through the dark tunnels and finally he reached the door. When he opened it, a bright light shone with red shadows and a gloomy voice softly said who dared to enter without knocking. A demon with tentacles on his head ran into a huge stone room that was deep in the highest mountain. He immediately began to say, Your Majesty, trouble has happened. Pardon me for not knocking, but I've come on very important business. The four-horned man sitting on the throne looked at him with his black eyes and asked what the matter was. Then the kneeling subordinate said that Demiurge 666 had awakened and immediately left the demonic kingdom. He fled to freedom after leaving our kingdom, and so for me, he is no longer the demon king. A gloomy voice loudly replied, What are you talking about? The subordinate opened his toothy mouth while thinking how to report it correctly, so as not to lose his life. At that moment, the grim voice ordered him to tell everything. Then the subordinate began to explain that the demiurge had escaped and showed a piece of paper on which it was written that I was tired of being a demon king. Don't come looking for me, assholes. To which a grim voice replied, So what if I am? The guy walked tapping his shoes on the hard tiles and spoke softly that it was so boring in the dungeon. The dead silence and the impenetrable darkness I've had enough of. But here it's different. It's so bright, and I like the different sounds. It's the Dacoma Castle of the Kingdom of Verdi, and it's so nice to look at this magical oasis. I think I'm happy. As the boy approached the big kingdom, he saw a ridge of high mountain ranges. He was very happy when he reached the entrance of the castle, which attracted by its architecture. Then he closed his eyes and thought why all the mountain roads go to the fortresses on the passes. But this dwelling looks beautiful, which is to be expected from a human kingdom. The boy jumped joyfully and looked first to the right, and saw a huge number of mountain rivers that flowed into a deep lake. Then he looked to the left and saw a densely populated city. Walking a few dozen meters, he thought that it must be very cozy inside the castle. Then the boy's gaze stopped at the top of the castle. Two violet stones were beating off the sun's rays and drew his eyes to the cross. But he was not at all interested in the gems. At that moment, he thought of who had put that damn cross there. Suddenly there was a loud voice. Hey, bummer, where are you from? Then the guy turned his head and started to say, I don't get it, you're talking to me. Two knights came out of the main gate and headed towards the guy. As the knight came closer, he pointed his spear at the guy and said, Where are you going like this? Then the guy looked at his things and thought, Bum, that's what he meant about me, and it's because of what I'm wearing, but my face is normal. 
The knight didn't wait for an answer and went on to say, how dare you hang around in front of Tacoma Castle? You've lost all fear. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Now quickly tell me your name. The boy silently pointed his finger at himself. Then the knight shouted menacingly, you are the only one here and I advise you to use your brains if you value your life. Meanwhile, the boy was thinking about not telling his true name. If someone finds out that my name is Demiurge 666, the rumors could spread quickly and then I could be hunted, but I've already chosen a quiet life. Now I have to put together a set of letters as quickly as possible before these two get completely pissed off. Then he smiled and started to say hello, people, I'm Deus. Suddenly there was a loud voice from your side, very stupid to call the name of an ancient god. You are not aware that you are in the capital of the kingdom of Verdi. Five knights came out of the main entrance and headed towards the guy. The main one came closer and continued to say, If I said such a stupid thing out of ignorance, I will forgive you this time. Then the demurge began to answer, You can call me whatever you want, but answer in the king's rooms there is a lot of light. I'm sick of the darkness. To which the chief knight began to reply, Boy, I'm giving you one last chance. Go back to the mountains where you belong. Don't even get your hopes up. To enter the castle, you need six qualities. The first is fortitude. The second is strength of mind. The third is wisdom and so on. But you don't have any of them, so get lost. Then the guy started answering how well that adds up because six is my favorite number. Tell me if the kingdom is strong enough for me to be its king. The chief raised his sword while shouting, how dare you insult the royal family? Such a sin is unforgivable and you will pay for your folly with your life. I will personally nail your corpse to the cross myself. A bright light gleamed in the Demiurge's eyes. He looked at the knight with a beastly look and shouted loudly, How dare you accuse me of all earthly sins? Suddenly the knight's head exploded and blood and brains scattered in different directions. Then the Demiurge quietly said, I wanted to lead a peaceful life, but you've brought it on yourself. The knight standing next to me with a trembling voice started to say, Sir Bruo, what is going on? Tell someone that I had a nightmare. The Demiurge calmly replied, everything is real, I am your nightmare. Suddenly the knight's face swelled up and his eyes popped out of his orbits. A few seconds later, the heads of the two knights close to him exploded. The Demiurge smiling said, you look so formidable, but without heads, you're better off. Everything would be different if you would treat me with respect. After that, the boy began to hum his favorite tune. The five remaining knights panicked and grabbed their weapons. They were trying to figure out what happened because the guy stood there with his hands in his pockets and didn't even move. One night started screaming and they were just torn to pieces. But how is that possible and now this guy is humming something? Then his comrade shouted no matter how he did it quickly kill him. At that moment the Demiurge waved his hand with his index finger forward. The knights didn't even have time to attack before their heads instantly exploded. After that, Demiurge continued humming his favorite tune and slowly walked towards the gate. The knights sitting on the watchtowers put in their arrows and drew the bowstring on their bows. Glavni shouted what looked to kill the uninvited guest, and the arrows whistled towards their target. Then the Demiurge, still singing, let out an angry howl. At that moment, he thought, first I've been humiliated, and now they won't let me in. Is that any way to treat a guest? The flying arrows were scattered with a scattering of sparks. Then the guy turned his gaze to the attackers and quietly began to say, now I'm going to have to kill you all. Immediately, the archers' heads exploded and their lifeless bodies hung on the railing. Blood spurted from their bodies and poured over the big granite painting of the one-horned man. How is it that hunter archers have become game? Now the world was beginning to change again. The decapitated bodies of the guards began to fly towards the entrance, thickly pouring blood onto the road. The Demiurge looked at this gruesome scene and walked through the pool of blood towards the center door. Demurg's calm and sonorous voice was clearly heard by everyone inside. Praise the blood I have shed. With your tears, bless the return of this body. But he was interrupted by the ringing of bells. Outside the castle walls, hordes of men were stomping towards the main gate. Then the leader ordered them all to assemble, for the enemy was already at the gates. One of the guards started to ask if the war had started. You see, I closed the main gate and everyone outside was already dead. The leader decided to raise the morale of the warriors saying, don't lose your dignity and don't let the gloomy anxiety take over your hearts. Even if we have to fight a monster, it is our duty to defend this holy land. I have read in the ancient chronicles of the coming threat. We know the growing power of the dark forces that feed on unrooted roots, but its essence remains the same. And the leader was about to say something, but a great explosion tore the huge door with him. The Demiurge entering the castle grounds began to speak. 
I couldn't hear what your leader was saying. Then he looked predatorily at the army of men while saying your shouts will be my triumphant fanfare. One of the knights began to scream, but how could it be? He killed our leader with one blow along with the first line of guards. The boy looked at the knights standing in his way as if they were prey. Suddenly a hurricane appeared and rained down on the knights. Only skeletons remained from the first line of defense. The demiurge leisurely passed forward covering the other line of defense with a dark hurricane. Suddenly the castle grounds became dark and only echoed with the loud screams of the dying. In the darkness it was impossible to make out how many more knights had fallen, but a few minutes later when the darkness cleared, the survivors saw the mountains of corpses. Some of the maddened warriors, seeing the rivers of blood, couldn't hear the screams of their comrades and asked to finish them off. Then the Demiurge fulfilled their requests and, controlling the dark hurricane, began to kill the others. At that moment, he closed his eyes and smiled, thinking that today was a good day. Being out in the open can be a lot of fun. Why didn't I escape from that damn demon dungeon before? Suddenly there was a loud voice, the omnipotent creator of our world, Father, Virtuous Lord. Your name shines with divine light as master of this world you appoint the beginning and the end. The Demiurge looked at the hero bowing his head before the sword. Then the hero went on to say, May your righteous light guide us in the darkness and grant victory to the emperor. Triumph over death and let truth triumph over death. From the fireball that appeared, a wave of energy flew out that restored the dark storm. Then the hero took up the hilt of his sword and continued to say, Please destroy the evil that has become before me. Give me the strength to defeat it. The hero raised his magic sword, and when it shone he drew a cross sharply aslant in the air saying, Everything started here and will end here. The demiurge began to speak so it was the aura light that destroyed my hurricane. And you are the blood I heard about you. But don't even try to scare me with a cross. The hero putting the sacred sword in front of him started to say, I don't know who you are, but you have black magic. It is unimaginable that you defeated the guards alone and invaded the castle of Tacoma. The aura light shone in the hero's eyes and he growled menacingly, You are the end of me. I am blessed by God. I may not be a pure blood, but my power is strong enough to take you down. Then the hero rushed forward and the holy sword whistled deafeningly through the air. The demiurge froze in anticipation, and just before it collided, he jumped aside. The sword struck the floor, and the impact of unimaginable force created such a stream of air that the bodies of the dead knights were scattered. Immediately a second crushing blow struck. The hero hit the enemy even harder while saying, You will not pass. A ringing sound came from the sacred sword, and the surviving knights felt the convulsive shaking of the stone floor under their feet. But the demiurge caught the ringing sword with two fingers. He smiled while saying, Our Heavenly Father, please kill this idiot. Which one of us will God hear? Well, you've already realized that prayer and your drawing of crosses in the air is of no use to me. At that moment, Demiurge pulled his free hand out of his pocket and straightened his fingers like spears and struck. He was instantly several meters behind the hero, holding his heart in his hand. The hero with a hoarse voice said, God, what is happening? Then Demiurge, turning to his opponent, confidently said, I also prayed and my God heard me. So don't threaten me with your God anymore. The eyes of the hero were filled with unimaginable horror, and he whispered that this was the coming threat described in the Chronicles. Then he dropped the holy sword and clutched his chest. The demiurge looked at his throbbing heart and said, Nonsense is written in your Chronicles, and it is not for me. Then his fingers clenched hard and blood spurted from the crushed heart. The knights guarding the king saw a shadow shrouded in a shrouded cloud. It had a ferocious power that terrified all living things. The demiurge looked at the knights and began to say, Your hero is dead. Bow your heads and welcome the new king. The commander-in-chief briefly replied, We are the last line of defense, and we are ready to give our lives for the palace. Then the old king gave an order. The strongest warriors of the kingdom prepare to defend your holy land against this pathetic imposter. Then he looked at the boy and started asking questions. Tell him your name and tell him you are alone here. The demiurge came closer and began to answer hello. You must have been waiting for me. I already told my name to the guards at the entrance. Oh yeah, I forgot. They're dead. You seem to be the king here. Maybe we can talk. At that moment, the commander-in-chief raised his spear, saying, How dare you speak to his majesty like that? The demiurge silently waved his index finger and a star flared up and immediately went out. The darkness rumbled triumphantly and a blood-curdling demonic howl was heard. Then a menacing rumbling roar rumbled under the knight's feet. Suddenly, dead men came from the deep tiers and chopped the guards with old rusty blades. 
After their work, they also suddenly fell underground. Then the Demiurge began to say, Don't be afraid. My boys have had enough and left. Someone had some objections. The few remaining knights shouted, The Demon King is approaching. We have nowhere to retreat to. A ray of sunlight bounced off the sword. Ritzar noticed this and began to shout, God has sent us a signal. He held a shield in his left hand and a long, massive sword in his right and walked towards his opponent with the remnants of his comrades. The second warrior recovered from the shock and put his spear in front of him, saying, Let's kill the demon with the holy weapon. At that moment, the demiurge laughingly said, Your weapon doesn't even emit aura light, and your legs are trembling from lying. Then he jumped up and spread his wings and headed towards the throne. He stopped in front of the king and started to say that now we can start talking. The frightened king immediately asked what you wanted money, maybe status. I'll give you anything I can. You want a house overlooking the lake. Maybe you'd be interested in a crowded city in the west of the kingdom. You'll live in a mountain fortress with seven towers of white stone. The demiurge showed his fangs and hissed, I've seen enough stones in my short life. I want the whole kingdom. Then the king shouted the kingdom, I won't give it to you for anything. After I die, my family will rule it all. Think carefully and accept my offer before I change my mind. Then the demiurge lowered himself to the ground and immediately replied, Do you really think I'm going to beg? If you don't want to, you'll just die. And when you die, I will be called a member of the royal family, and then the kingdom will be mine by law. When the king heard this, he became furious and started shouting furiously, You must want my daughter. There's no way I'm giving my daughter to some imposter of muddy blood. The boy scratched the back of his head and answered in surprise, I didn't know you had a daughter. To which the king replied, Don't touch her. April is the pride of the continent of Horsens, the flower of the royal family. The demiurge calmly replied, I don't need your daughter and you're wrong about my blood. Nothing changes from generation to generation and I decided that I need your family. At that moment, the out-of-control king shouted with all his might, How dare you lay claim to something that doesn't belong to you? If you don't like the city in the west of the kingdom, then get out. Then the demiurge grudgingly asked if it was all yours. Without hesitation, the king replied, Of course the kingdom belongs to the royal family. Whatever you do, you can't break this chain. The Demiurge began to explain that this world has been yours since its creation, but the castle along with the highest mountain shield belonged to someone else. Then he looked the king deeply in the eyes and asked how long you have been here. The king replied that it had always been like this. Then the boy went on to say that the royal family had appropriated this place. You've sat on the throne for hundreds of years and enjoyed it without giving it away. So it's only fair that I take it back. Then the king spat spittle and shouted, do you think the sacred people will accept you? Soon everyone will know what you have done in the royal court and there will never be forgiveness for you. To which the demiurge replied, I don't care. I will not ask forgiveness from your sacred people. The last thing the king heard was, you know, I'll get over it somehow, but you won't. Then the guy waved his index finger and suddenly fire broke out. Then he clapped his hands together and a wave of fire began to consume everything in its path. All the windows in the castle instantly flew out and the fire wave struck upwards and tore the top of the cross, and the gems scattered into thousands of small shards. Demir said softly, Light Sovereign, the last king of men, he wanted to overcome the highest knight of the world forever. Shining like the sun, the shield in the night, the black swords broke, and the light sword shone like lightning between the black rocks, and the king was able to dispel the night, but not to overcome it, and his star rolled forever beyond the edge of heaven. Then the boy's gaze stopped on the hot king, and he went on to say, You don't seem to have a drop of blood in you. If you did, you'd last a few seconds longer. As a man, you've lived a long life. I'm sure ordinary people don't live that long. By then, the king's blackened body was already burning. The demiurge looked up and shouted loudly, Hey God, you've upset me. They weren't ready at all. The disgusting thing is that when that old man spoke, that sort of spit flew out and got on me. God, how am I supposed to live with that? Afterwards, the Demiurge looked at the blackened walls and floors strewn with corpses and thought what a mess this place was. He started to calm himself down. First, they called me a bum. I don't know what that means. Then they wouldn't let me into the castle. And finally, they wouldn't give up the kingdom in a nice way. It turns out people are to blame for all their troubles. But more importantly, we have to wait for the pure blood to awaken. It's about 20 years away. I guess I'm in a bit of a hurry because it's supposed to happen on the day of my coming. I'm supposed to be out of the demon realm in 20 years. So we'll have to wait for the pure blood to awaken. At that moment, the Demiurge heard a rustle and started to turn around. 
he saw a girl standing in a tight summer dress that revealed her shoulders and breasts. A pearl necklace glistened on her slim waist. The dress emphasized the beauty of her body. Tears rolled down from her huge blue eyes. The girl looked at the guy and shouted, Who the hell are you? Without waiting for an answer, the girl sobbing continued to speak. I heard the ground shaking and thought that the volcano woke up. Explain to me what's going on here. At that moment, the guy thought about the fact that the people who won the first war did not even realize that it was not the end and began to live a quiet life again. But the losing demons returned to the underworld with the defeated demon king's soul and placed it in a new body. For several days, the demons performed powerful rituals to glamorize and curse the body for the next 100 years. After 100 years, they resurrected the demon king again. The new demon was named Azazel and upon awakening immediately began to gather his demonic army. He gathered an army of thousands of demons before leaving the underworld and ordered the conquest of the kingdom of Verde and the castle of Dacoma to be leveled to the ground. During the Second War, the demons thought the humans had no heroes left and were ready to take over their lands. Azazel, the mighty demon king, fought the humans. He destroyed many cities on his way, and when he began to attack the castle of Dacoma, an unknown hero appeared, who bravely walked over the corpses of demons and struck with a sacred axe. The hero relentlessly killed the demons and gave orders to hold the line and chop the flanks first. Meanwhile, he searched for the source of the dark forces. And when he saw Azazel, he realized that the demonic army can only be defeated in one way. 133. The hero managed to sneak through the enemy horde and attack the demon king. In the battle, he broke his sacred axe, which was deeply embedded in the demon's head. Azazel lost, but the demons returned to the underworld with the defeated king's soul and placed it in a new body which they enchanted and cursed for the next 100 years. After the resurrection, the new demon king went back into battle with the humans. And once again, the hero was brought in to tirelessly slay the demons while protecting his holy land. The new demon king used impenetrable darkness to destroy the human army. But the hero lit his way with the light of his aura and found the source of dark forces and won the victory. Then he had to resurrect another demon king. The story of the hero who will come and save everyone has long been boring. People let their guard down and began to think that the brave man would always show up at the right moment. Meanwhile, the demons in the underworld performed powerful rituals every day for 100 years. They believed that this king would be the last. With the help of dark magic, they managed to create a body no different from a human. With all their strength, they resurrected the 666 demon king. The resurrected demon king was named Demiurge 666. After awakening, Demiurge heard the last words of the ritual carrying hopelessness to all people on earth, come and show us the way but he decided not to raise a demon army. The lad was untamable and different from previous kings in that he wouldn't obey anyone. Soon he escaped from the underworld, leaving behind a note, I'm sick of being a demon king and don't look for me assholes. At that moment, the girl screamed, how many more times do I have to ask what you did to my father, evil sorcerer? The demiurge wondered why she was being so aggressive towards me. I didn't do anything wrong. I was just standing up for my rights and she doesn't care. He had a flashback in his mind where the king was screaming furiously for his daughter. April is the pride of our continent and a beautiful flower of the royal family. Then the guy started answering, so you're Princess April. Your father wasn't deceiving you. You're really very beautiful. The king is dead. And before he died, he gave me permission to marry his daughter. So now you're mine. And as a member of the royal family, I must ascend to the throne. You don't mind. Then the girl screamed in hysterical panic. What did you say you killed my father? I will never forgive you for that. Demurg waved his forefinger, saying the incantation I appeal to you. Spirit of piss, let the spark in your heart ignite. I attract you and stop looking away from me. Let him be thirsty and have no sleep or rest until he comes to me. Let her give her soul to me and her body to my every whim. I conjure it, be done. April immediately calmed down and bowed to her lord, saying, My humble body belongs to you from now on. Take me away. The Demiurge spread his wings and flew up to the girl, thinking, I never thought I would ever need this spell. But it seems to be working. He gently pulled back a strand of hair, causing the girl's heart to race. Then he took April's chin and touched her soft lips with his finger. The guy looked mysteriously at her gorgeous body, and the girl couldn't help but reach for his lips, saying, Thank you, master. She looked with her big blue eyes full of life. The girl felt that her legs became cotton, and in a trembling voice she said, Please touch me. Then the guy put his hand on the thin wasp waist and gently pressed her to him. He started to say, for now you are my first human. 
Demiurge, feeling the girl's breath on his lips, suddenly started to say, Stop peeping, come out before you poke your eyes out. From the black ball hanging in the air came a voice I expected nothing less from you, my lord. I was burned at once. Suddenly the balloon grew to human size and out of it came a guy with a big hat covering his face. The guy took off his hat and a fierce glint appeared in his red eyes. Then he started to say either nothing or dot 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 Demurge unhappily started to say you've been following me all this time. To which the guy replied without hesitation, you underestimate me, my lord. I am always with you wherever you go. Then the Demurge angrily continued to say you are lying again. You serve my father and not me. I'm starting a new life now. But the boy lowered his gaze and began to justify himself. Your body was handed over to you by your predecessors. You are the only one left, my lord. Demurg waved his hand and began to say to me anyway, Go ahead, because I'm not going to the kingdom of demons anymore. But the guy smiled and started to answer, I'm just following your orders, so don't mind me. Go on with what you started. Then the demiurge flapped his wings while saying what I started. Now I'm free, and I can fly wherever I want. But the guy pointed his finger at the girl who couldn't take her eyes off her lover and started to say, Tell the truth you wanted to fill this girl with your life-giving seed. I'm Alex and I've been in your basement for the last 80 years, so it's not easy to fool me because I know almost everything about you. I've devoted a lot of time and energy to you. Listen to the sacrifices I've made and don't hold back your tears. I breastfed you without changing my own body. The Demiurge immediately replied that was not necessary because I didn't ask you to give me your breasts. Alex continued, I was like a perfect teacher with all my heart instructing you, young master. The Demiurge objected again. So why did you beat me with an electric whip until I lost my pulse? Then Alex answered, I took care of you until the end when you were on the threshold of awakening. The Demiurge insisted, but you tied me up and handed me over to those bloodthirsty demons. Alex didn't pay attention and spoke as if only yesterday you were stomping your tiny feet and waving your hands. Now you're all big and looking at women. I think I'm going to cry. The Demiurge couldn't contain his emotions and shouted, shut your black mouth. I don't want to hear it, remember. I was a demon king in the past. Today I've been reborn and become a human creator. I'm ending this conversation. At that moment, Alex smiled and made a nice face and started to say, of course, as you say, my lord, I don't want to argue with you. Demurg thought what is going on and why do I feel like I don't understand something? Alex must be up to something, but I'm not a little boy and I understand everything. Then he shouted, what else you're up to? Admit why you just accepted it and hurry up. Alex laughed out loud and started to say, I'm sorry, I'll tell you everything. My lord, there are many beautiful places, but why did you decide to attack this country? Demiurge put his hands in his pockets and started to say a good question I have difficulty to answer. But Alex continued to ask his highness the king quietly encroached on your territory, or was he hungry for the riches of the underworld? Or just because you were sad? That's a good reason, too. Give me a real reason. The Demiurge began to answer, I can't tell you why. I just decided to live my life as a king instead of an ordinary mortal. When Alex heard that, he started clapping his hands happily. But the Demiurge began to shrink for some reason. He didn't understand why the mentor reacted like that and asked for clarification. And Alex immediately began to explain how a demon king would do it. You came to Earth and immediately took over the largest kingdom. You slaughtered the entire royal guard. Then you killed the strongest hero in the kingdom and finally took the life of the king. And to top it off, you subjugated the princess. The princess is not some witch with a wart on her nose. Only she's very beautiful and people pay attention to that. And back to your theme, you are truly evil. What more can you do to be a king? With each successive clap of his hands, the demiurge grew younger and younger. He began to say I'd never even considered such things. Alex explained that a human creature or even a high-ranking demon like me should take care of the future. And since the great lord had abandoned us and refused to be king, suddenly a bright light flashed over Alex's head. At that time, the demiurge froze looking at the bright glow. After a few seconds, the mentor continued to say, I will take your son to the demon kingdom and make him a king. On this day, 20 years from now, your son will become demiurge, 666, and I am sending him to this world. Suddenly, a mysterious light appeared in Alex's eyes. He froze for a moment and felt the robe thicken and spread apart. Two fiery wings snapped and flared open, scattering purple sparks. The glimmers of fire in his wings slowly flared up. 
the eternal flame servant appeared before his eyes. His body suddenly grew to a gigantic size and appeared in its true form. The Demiurge watched what was happening and was very frightened. Then he turned his gaze to the girl. April continued to kneel and reached out to him again, saying, Master, I felt so warm when you touched me. Please take me. He jerked back and was even more frightened. But April continued to say, Your tutor said that I am of extraordinary beauty. Look at my beautiful dress made of elastic. It accentuates the lines of my figure beautifully. Would you like me to take it off? Then the Demiurge turned around and started to say, Well, this is too much for me. I almost got into trouble. At my age, what kind of children can there be? I'm only 80 years old. Alex started yelling, No, wait. My lord, come back. She's ready and you're running away with your tail between your legs. Then the Demiurge turned his head and gave him a menacing look. Alex realized that it was better to keep silent and immediately started to say, Sorry, my lord, I must have overreacted and I won't say that again. Demiurge didn't want to hear anything and shouted, now I will shut your mouth once and for all. Then he waved his hands angrily, and without even realizing it created an incredibly strong beam of energy. Alex saw a bright burst and started to chase it automatically. The beam easily broke through the wall and rushed forward. From the top of the castle, a crack of the exploded stone wall was heard and echoed through the streets of the city. The mountain shield standing a few kilometers away took the blow but an incredibly strong stream of energy broke through the rock and hit the ground and exploded. Alex miraculously managed to avoid the devastating blow. He picked up his hat from the ground. He wiped the dust off it and immediately put it back on his head. The top of the castle caught fire, throwing large clouds of thick smoke into the air. The pierced mountain and the ground that had taken the blow were ablaze with fire. Meanwhile, Demurg turned into a boy and did not understand what had happened and began to say that you wanted to set me up, you creepy crawlies. Alex looked at the boy and thought he was special. I've raised a lot of demon kings throughout history. I've tried every method, but this one defies my training. He's not yet fully formed, but he's so strong. 666 stands out from his predecessors. Maybe this time we'll win. We'll take them over and take what should have been ours long ago. The most important thing is not to lose contact with Pan. Then Alex started to say, you're right. King is a bit of a mouthful. It's better to start from scratch. Without turning his head, the Demiurge answered that we are a team now. I will be the fighter for justice and you will be the hero. Alex objected that I can't be a hero. Then Demiurge began to explain the plan, I will be a good hero and I will be his buddy. I have to be with the hero to get information in his shadow and not stand out. 206, no one will ever guess that the hero's inconspicuous sidekick is the Demon King. As long as the hero is in my face, I'll enjoy my life. You'll do the plowing and the glory will be mine. Alex immediately fell to his knees and began to beg understand that without the Demon King, there will be no hero while you become his ally. Come to your senses, my lord. Demirge flapped his wings and rising in the air said, then let's find a hero. Alex pressed his hat to his head while saying, my lord, but there is a princess here. Then the Demirge answered, I don't know anything. I give you permission to do whatever you want with her. Then Alex asked if she wasn't the main character, to which the Demirge replied that he was just bluffing. Meanwhile, someone was watching them. The unfamiliar girl smiled and started to say thank you for showing up at the right moment. My lord seems to me 666 malfunctioned. He's a little underdeveloped and of low intelligence, but it will be easier for me to take away his abilities. Then she calmly looked into the terrifying eyes and went on to say, I'm sorry, but I'll take your powers for a while. The girl dressed in a short translucent dress looked at me with a chilling gaze while saying, I'm sure he'll forgive me. It's all going according to the script anyway. A little while later, a wagon was driving down the grassy road. Alex sat in the front and drove a pair of horses. He held the reins with one hand and a rose in the other. Demirge sat comfortably on the straw in the back and began to sing. Sir hero, sir hero, sir hero, our frail hero, where are you? You better show yourself if you want to live. The dumb hero will come with me and lead and I'll get the glory. Our feeble hero is your opponent, the demon king. And the demon king is gone. Alex started to say that your songs are stupid and why do we have to travel in a cart when we can fly and it's much more comfortable. But the Demiurge frowned his eyebrows while telling her you want everyone to know that you are a demon. You remember what I said before. Alex turned around and pointing his finger at the ruin with which the thick smoke was billowing started to say, do you care after what you did to the castle? Demiurge turned on his side while saying, I don't care, there was a fire. Then Alex immediately responded by saying you had a lot of fun. But please consult me next time and tell me if you really want to be a hero's companion. The Demiurge smiled and said yes, 
They say that not only purebloods are accepted as companions, and I will be the most common and the top of the rich guy, while someone else will fight with monsters. Alex started to say you'll be a hero's companion, but it will be hard to stay in the top. Demurge began to explain, I am a former demon king you are from the Great Seven Underworld. It's not that complicated. The hero will shred the dragon like a chicken if we help him. Alex asked in surprise if you want to be human and use magic. The Demurge answered naturally, Since I have it, you idiot, now I see why you lost to humans 665 times. By the way, these Hilyaks no say right heroes are divided into any ranks. Alex immediately replied, Yes, they do, my lord. Then Demurge asked if it's like rank A, rank B. To which Alex replied something like that. There's a hero of rank D, Draco Boy, who sends dragons to slaughter. At that moment, the guy imagined a horned dragon breathing fire and a hero who covers himself with a shield from the fire wave. After a few seconds, the Demiurge continued talking, meaning you have to kill the evil dragon to get the title. And he's big and strong enough for humans. Alex began to say dragons don't need neither demons nor humans. Their attacks on the village are a thing of the past, but a D rank can kill a dragon. There is also a rank G, the storm of giants that leaves nothing of the giants. The Demiurge asked who comes after rank G. Then Alex answered that the next rank is L, the Lich Killer. He has great power and can kill a Lich. The guy continued to ask why there are so many of them. Alex said that all the others are in alphabetical order. The Demiurge started to say titles are given out of thin air, but why these three were singled out. To which Alex replied, I don't know. That's how the Hero Management Department decided. The most recent P rank is like expired merchandise. They are like apples that no one bought, so they overripe fell and turned to mush. The Demiurge was surprised and started saying, expired goods rot and stink. I guess nobody likes P-Rank. But Alex went on to say the higher the rank, the more you are supported by the nobility and the more important your position is. People don't just ignore procrastination. They want heroes of that rank to disappear. Then the Demiurge calmly replied, what a cruel world. People are so stupid they destroy themselves. Alex turned his head and looked at him with a stern look while saying, but there is something much more important than any rank and that is blood. The Demiurge began to speak. I think I understand the closer you are to the purebloods, the stronger you are. We need to think it over carefully to survive here and not let this blood spoil my plans. Then Alex said, you've got it right. The first saviors of the world 66580 years ago were a hero and a priestess. They gained their power in tandem, the hero through years of training and the priestess through the study of spells. The children born to them received some of their power as an inheritance then grandchildren were born, and so continued the line of pure bloods. People test their blood for purity, and the purer it is, the stronger their energy aura. People have even fought amongst themselves for years, and for some reason, it's made them stronger. There's a reason the holy bloodline is called blood. This bloodline has the purest blood and has become the protagonist and won the main battle 665 times. The Demiurge began to ask if everyone was measuring the purity of their blood. Whoever is closest to the original Holy Bloodline gets the highest rank. Alex answered without hesitation that there are exceptions, but the purer the blood, the stronger they are. Then Demurg started to say the whole pure blood thing is such nonsense. I've never heard of blood spoons. I've been in an egg for 80 years because of this war. Alex, with a serious look on his face, started to say that everyone takes it seriously and is willing to make sacrifices. To which the Demiurge replied, I thought so. At the very end, the hero and the demon king will fight. Wars haven't ended in 60,000 years because of that one phrase. Then Alex went on to say that phrase has long been a promise. The Demiurge was surprised to hear that after the first war, you have been here every hundred years. It must be nice to live here because everything looks so beautiful. Alex said that no one wants to live peacefully in the rhythm of our wagon that goes so slowly. The Demiurge got up abruptly and pointing his finger in the sky started to say, look what kind of thing is flying above us. It's a butterfly, calmly answered Alex. The fluttering butterfly was circling above the wagon, and when the guy stretched out his hand, it started to come closer to his finger. The fluttering wings became slower, and it clung to his finger with its small legs. The Demiurge had a chance to get a close look at her colorful wings. Suddenly the wagon drove into a hole and the hard wooden wheels rumbled. The butterfly fluttered its wings and began to move away. The Demiurge shouted unhappily, watch where you're going. He stretched out his arm in the hope that it would return, but the butterfly flew farther and farther away. Then the guy started to ask what it was that flew by and messed up my hair. Alex started to answer that it was the wind. Sometimes in a hurricane it can be dangerous. Demiurge started to say, I like the wind, and it's not dangerous at all. 
Then he looked up and wondered what was up there. There's a balloon hovering over my head, and I feel like it's warming me. Then the guy covered his eyes with his hand and continued to say, if you look at it long enough, your eyes start to hurt, so it's so bright. Alex answered that it's the sun. Sometimes it warms stronger, sometimes weaker, depending on the weather. The sun moves slowly across the sky. Then the demiurge replied, well, you must have been joking about moving. I can see that the orb is standing still. Then Alex started to say the sun only shines during the day, and at night another ball appears in the sky, and you can look at it normally. The demiurge was excited to see it. You know, that smell makes my heart flutter. Alex answered, it's the smell of spring, and if you pay attention, there are colorful flowers growing on the ground. That's what they smell like. The guy was looking around curiously trying to see the flowers, and after a couple of minutes he said, Alex, you have lived a long life. Alex started to say, yes, I was born after the first war and there are seven such dukes in the demon world. The place we are in now is called the surface. The demiurge began to speak. Now I understand why humans are so protective of the surface. The old demon kings must have never seen such beauty. I want to stay here as long as possible. If I'd obeyed, I would have spent two more decades under lock and key before I came here. To die at the hands of a hero, I don't know. It's a good thing I escaped. I wish they'd just abolish the position of demon king. You agree with me? Alex turned his head and gave me a stern look and began to say I've been explaining it to you all along. It's time to draw some conclusions. There's no telling how your outing will end. But what I do know is that I'm going to have to take the fall. The demiurge made himself comfortable in the hay, saying, Okay, I get it. I'm going to get some sleep. He put his hand under his head and went on to say, Wake me up when we get there. And just in case, don't take me to the underworld or we'll both die. Alex immediately answered, Yes, my lord. The guy slowly blinked his eyes and said, Only drive carefully or there is a cliff. Alex silently accepted the rose and the horses slowed down. Half an hour later, Alex started to speak, My lord, we are almost there. Demiurge slowly raised his head and trying to open his eyes started to ask if we are already there. Alex briefly thought and answered everything as you wanted. There is trade here and it is not a war zone like most unremarkable places. This village is called Zorix. The demiurge with a sleepy voice started to answer, Zorix is not bad. Then Alex pulled the right reins and the horses turned to the main street. The boy asked if there were any heroes here. There are quite a lot of people here. Alex started to answer. There are only two families of heroes in this village. The first one is of A rank, but almost of G rank. And the fallen family, so you have nothing to fear, my lord. Demiurge looked suspiciously at the people and started to say, Alex, you come here once in a hundred years and maybe everything has changed. There is definitely no D rank here. To which Alex replied that if every castle had a Draca boy, our army of demons would not dare to set foot on the surface. The Demiurge asked in a surprised voice if D-ranked heroes are that strong. Alex answered without hesitation, but if a D-rank hero is able to kill a dragon, then an ordinary demon is not a threat to him. Suddenly Demiurge heard a woman's voice. Did you hear the news that a dragon attacked the castle of Trier? I was told that the castle is already half burnt down. The man started to answer, yes, it can't be, and it's bad that they haven't caught the dragon and you don't even think about going near that castle. The girl immediately replied, didn't the dragons die years ago, and how is that possible? Are they making a triumphant return? If the legends are true, the dragons will make such a hell here. The demiurge pointed his finger at the girl and started to say, hey, you said that dragons don't need humans. Alex immediately answered that I thought so. I haven't been on earth for 80 years. Maybe something happened during my absence. There was a voice of a man standing next to me. Tell the news to Sanctus Maximus Populi to send a hero of D rank. Alex started to speak, my lord. Let's stay at the best hotel in the area. Upon reaching the place, the demiurge began to speak, and it is a hotel. Well, we don't have a choice anyway. And anyway, stop calling me lord. Now I am the master for you. The wooden door opened and Alex walked into the hotel, followed by demiurge. The manager immediately started to say, welcome to our golden pavilion. Alex stopped near the man and taking off his hat from his head started to say, we need a penthouse, my master is very selective. The manager with a smile on his face thought they were dressed like two ordinary country bumpkins. And he started to say that you came from far away. And that's why you don't know that a penthouse costs a lot. Alex immediately opened the box he had brought with him, which was filled with gold and jewelry. Treasure stolen from Tacoma Castle. The manager stretched his hand to the treasures and shouted, Sviatosha, take our visitors to the most expensive penthouse. Suddenly, two boys ran out of the hallway. The first one got caught and sprawled on the floor, screaming sorry. The second one stopped and started to say that I am not Sviatosha, but Sviatochi, 
I'm tired of repeating myself. The manager looked at him with a stern look and ordered him to shut up and bring the guests quickly. The boy went up to the guests and bowed. After that, he straightened up and with his hands at the seams began to say, I am Zeke Pan Sviatochi, but you can call me Zeke. Go upstairs and I'll take the luggage. Walking up the wooden stairs, the guy continued to talk. We got a bit noisy with the news of the attack on the castle of Trier. To think a dragon from legend has appeared. But don't worry about a thing. We have a family in the village of a hero of rank A that is almost rank G. The demiurge walking behind us quietly said, aha, calmly. Zeke opened the door and stepping inside, continued to speak. Our penthouse is the main highlight of the Golden Pavilion. Look, there are several large rooms here. They're located at the very top, which is a big plus because you can see the whole village from the windows. The guy held the jewelry box in front of him and kept talking. But I don't know if this will convince you, but I'll try to make your stay comfortable. Make yourself comfortable and call me if you need anything. The demiurge looked at the boy and asked him if you have their blood in you, yes. Zeke immediately began to answer yes a little bit. Then the demiurge went on to say that's why you're so weird. Alex started to ask, my lord, can I go to the rooms to look around? Demiurge angrily replied, I told you to call me master. Then he looked at the guy and continued to say you have blood, but you are weak. And if you carry luggage, then you are from the fallen family of Zorix heroes. Your ancestors in your lineage have had their blood stained for so many generations. Maybe you know how much of it is pure. The boy blushed and reluctantly began to answer, unfortunately only rank P expired. But I've been learning a bit about swordsmanship. Suddenly, the wall of the penthouse exploded. A wave of fire hit with great force and threw Zeke off. The guy falling to the ground dropped the jewelry box and everything started to spill out. The demiurge watched with his hands in his pockets. Zeke immediately stood up and noticed a huge hole in the ceiling. Alex also looked up to see what had happened. Tongues of flame began to devour the wooden room. A loud roar seemed to grow, and after a few seconds they saw a vicious dragon flying nearby. The ravenous beast circled the sky and landed on the roof of the burning hotel. A jet of fire flew out of its mouth, aimed at the neighboring houses. The people below started running in terror. Meanwhile, Zeke started shouting, Young master, save yourselves quickly. I think there's a dragon on the roof. It's going to eat us. The demiurge looked at Alex calmly while saying that dragons don't need humans at all, and that's your words. Then Alex reluctantly answered, I just suggested. Then the demiurge immediately looked at Zeke and started to say, Okay, I believe you, Zeke Pansviatochi. It is very dangerous to be here. I can see the fear in your eyes, but I think I can help you with this. I'll be your rock. Come on, be a hero. You know, I've been looking for a hero for a while now. It's fate. Take it, and then I'll give you riches and fame you never dreamed of. Zeke cried out in a trembling voice, but I'm a rank P overdue. That means I'll die before I can do anything. But the demiurge continued to persuade the boy, saying I'll get you out of the overdue title. You want to live the rest of your life as a P without ever picking up a sword. Maybe take the offer and change your fate. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. At that moment, Zeke remembered a situation from his childhood when he was told that procrastinators had a drop of holy blood. Why do they have kids? Who end up being losers anyway? The expired goods so they don't starve to death. My sister repeatedly told my brother, when mom and dad get back, I'm hungry. Coming to his senses, Zeke immediately fell to his knees and bowed as low as he could and began to say, be my support. I'm a P rank, but I'll do my best. You won't regret giving me a chance. I am ready even to give my soul for the realization of my dream. The demiurge smiled and showing his clicks said, I would have asked her to do that too. At that moment, the dragon clawed the Cretia and began to break it. But the shouts of the humans distracted his attention, and the serpent glittered with its four eyes and began to search for a victim. The demiurge waved his hand, and when the mysterious purple smoke appeared, he looked at Zeke and offered to make a deal. I propose a contract, side A Dems and side B Zeke Pan Sviatochi. 315 side B will make side A its companion. Party B will obey party A without question. The contract is for an indefinite period of time, and only party A can break it. Party B will receive fame and fortune in the amount that Party A chooses. The Demiurge looked at the boy seriously while saying Party B has no objections to the above conditions. Sign if you agree. That's how we seal our deal. Zeke clenched his teeth and thought this contract was completely and frankly unprofitable for me. But the fame and fortune I've dreamed of all my life is worth so much more. I will never again allow my family to be humiliated, and I will do everything I can to live well. Then the boy shouted loudly, Isaac Penis Viatochi agree to give up my soul. 
I will do whatever you ask me to do, Lord. The edges of the Demiurge's lips creased and two small clicks showed. In that moment, he thought everything was going according to plan. The sweep of the flared wings further ignited the burning top of the hotel. Zeke crouched down in fear as the dragon seemed to fly somewhere. The Demiurge pointed his finger to the sky while saying, Go after that dragon. Alex standing next to him started to say, Master, but the dragon is beyond the power of a normal human. You're signing a death sentence by sending the boy there. Then the Demiurge smiled and started to answer, I think I have an idea. Let him pretend to kill the dragon, but we will do it. First, Alex will go talk to the dragon. Then he's going to drop him off with the procrastinator. At that point, the expired item will be on the ground waving his sword at the dragon. Then the procrastinator will walk over and put his foot on the dead body of the dragon. And people will scream, look, there's the hero who saved us. Wow, what a baloney. Then our hero will raise his sword high above his head and tell everyone he's a badass. Zeke opened his mouth in surprise, but his body kept shaking. Alex started to answer, but people won't believe that a P-ranked hero defeated the dragon by himself. And if you become a companion of a D-ranked hero, you won't be able to live a peaceful life. But the Demiurge didn't listen to Alex at all. He looked at the guy and showed his tongue and started to say why the fucker is staring at me so strangely. Then he went over to Zeke and put him on his feet. The guy was scared and started to say, Sir, I don't think I'm ready for this fight. But the Demiurge ripped off his shirt in one swift motion. Then he walked over to the table where the pot was and picked it up. The Demiurge said cheerfully, I think that's a start. Then he put the pot on the guy's head and continued to say that for the sake of mystery, you should hide your face. Suddenly, two beams of fire came out of the Demiurge's eyes and started burning holes in the pot. Zeke looked through the missing holes and screamed, God, what is happening to me? Meanwhile, the Demiurge took the torn shirt and tied it around the guy's neck. He said, now you are a masked hero and your head is protected by impenetrable steel and the cloak from the corridor uniform will protect your body from fire. Alex asked what this was for. Then Demiurge started to answer that heroes always wear capes and shorts. That way he won't be recognized and it sounds cool. Then a mysterious new hero appeared. Alex went to the hole in the wall and started to say, well then, I'm going after the dragon. He picked up his hat and continued talking as always, I have to do all the dirty work. Before Alex crawled out, the Demiurge reassured him that if he dealt with the dragon quickly, he could get some rest. Then he turned to the boy. Zeke, we have no time to waste. The guy made a disgruntled look and started telling me to go fight the dragon right away. I'm afraid people won't understand and will laugh. The Demiurge looked around and saw that there was a broom on the ground, so he walked over and kicked it up with his foot. Zeke stretched out his arm and when he caught the broom, he asked what it was, sir. The Demiurge briefly replied, hold your holy sword. Stay like that and don't let go of the sword even if the dragon is in your face. And I promise you'll get so much wealth and fame you'll burst. At that moment, Zeke felt his body tremble and an unfamiliar feeling came over him. He began to say, I've been bullied by people all my life and now I'm not even ashamed. On the bright side, I've always wanted to fight monsters. Then he gripped the broom tighter as if he really intended to destroy whoever came to him. The sudden burst of power made his eyes light up and a star shone in his forehead. The boy believed in himself and continued to say, I will earn respect with blood and sweat. The sudden urge was most likely due to the particles in Zeke's blood. The hero's instincts awakened inside his hemoglobin. And the hero's blood boiled with the desire to tear the demon king to pieces. Zeke, however, had no idea of this and thought differently. He raised the broom above his head and began to speak. I look into Sir Dem's eyes and begin to believe that I can defeat the dragon. Master, I want to get the fame and fortune I desire. The Demiurge made a horrible grimace and gave the order to get down to business right now. Zeke immediately rushed forward and barked his tongue out. The loud and heartbreaking screams of the people whose homes were being devoured by the fire echoed throughout the village. Some of them were praying to God, hiding in the church. The dragon circled over the village and once again opened its black maw, sucked in a huge amount of air, and then exhaled a jet of fire. People raised their heads up and saw that the jet of fire silently fell on the church. At that moment, the dragon was looking for someone else to grease. A priest ran out of the church enveloped in flames and started shouting, God, please save us from imminent death. The dragon flew on and began destroying the main street. Several houses immediately caught fire, and at that moment, a purple circle appeared above the burning church, from which Alex jumped out and landed on top of the cross. He looked fiercely as if he was waiting for some sign and patiently and motionlessly planned his attack. The dragon once again released a jet of fire and noticed the movement and changed its flight path. The mighty predator opened its fiery maw and approached the church again. 
Alex, standing on top of the cross from his back, released a set of long paws. Black and sharp claws wriggled like snakes, as if waiting for an order. As the dragon flew by, a shadow ran across Alex's face. He immediately jumped and closing in on him shouted, My lord has passed judgment on you. Alex, who was on top of him, started to get closer while bringing all his paws above his head. Black claws glistened on his straightened fingers, ready to strike. Alex perfectly calculated the distance, and when his feet landed on the dragon's back, then a hail of blows followed him. Sharp claws easily penetrated the dragon's scales. The barbed hands went through the hard muscle and into the heart. Claws tearing through flesh reached the heart and drove into it like hooks. Then thin barbed hands began to braid it. The dragon felt his heart constricted by a premonition of evil doom and roared loudly. Then Alex began to ask why you flew to the castle. Didn't the dragons and humans make a truce? Instead of answering, Alex heard a cracking sound, and the dragon's scales began to rise. Unknown one-eyed creatures came out one by one. They merged with each other like roots of a tree, at the same time wrapping around the dragon's body. Alex, in a surprised voice, began to ask what was happening to you. I bound your heart. Then the dragon growled something in an unknown language. But Alex did not think long and answered that such a dragon should not express himself so low. Who do you think you are? There's something wrong here. The dragon opened its mouth in pain and waved its head. But this attempt was useless, because Alex was strongly held by dozens of barbed hands. At that moment, an unkind glint appeared in Alex's eyes and he squeezed the dragon's heart even harder. Meanwhile, Zeke ran a few dozen meters and stopped not far from the houses. The guy's body was glistening with sweat. He was clutching the broom in his hand, and it was clear from the expression of his mouth and eyes that he was serious about it. Suddenly he heard a man's voice. It was a cook with a pot on his head. Look, he's the only one down there. Zeke looked in the direction of the voice and saw a man standing in front of the window. Then a woman came to the window and started asking why he wasn't hiding. From the neighboring house, the windows were facing the opposite direction, and a voice was heard he wants to defeat the dragon alone. That guy's a hero. Then Zick saw a girl come to the window and starts talking about how this hero looks like a pervert in that outfit. Maybe he really is a pervert. Zeke picked up the pot and thought how creepy. I'm scared and ashamed at the same time. The Demiurge sat not far away on a large log and watching the scene began to shout, Hey, masked hero, you are a valiant hero. Honor and praise you and keep it up. Please save our Zorix. The girl immediately opened the window and started talking, so he is a true hero. From the neighboring windows, a voice was heard, Sir Hero, save us. Then Zeke raised his brush above his head and started to answer. I'm getting ready, the dragon is coming. Thank you all. After that, the boy thought, this is my chance in a million. Don't miss out on fame and fortune. He felt people's eyes on him, and to show he was serious, he started waving his broom. Meanwhile, high in the sky, the battle continued. The dragon, in an attempt to throw off the enemy, changed its flight path sharply. Then it once again roared loudly. Suddenly, the dragon's wings folded, and it began to fall to the ground. But at the very collision, its wings sharply unfolded, and a jet of fire flew out. The fireball hit the roof of the house. After that, the dragon started to gain height again. Alex, sitting on his back, realized that the huge heart could not be crushed so easily. So he decided to change his tactics and stretched his arms. Then Alex said a short spell and the thorny paws began to braid around the dragon's neck, forming a noose. He realized what he had to do, and shouted a hundred demon brushes ordering to tighten the noose. And the tighter the noose was tightened, the brighter the dragon's eyes began to shine. Alex did not hesitate and said, I tried to calm you down, naughty lizard, but now I can't help you. You can't calm him down like that. Now that he's trapped in my trap, I'll have to use the last one to pierce his heart. A hand of incredible strength pierced the scales and plunged deep into the heart. The dragon roared again. This time its roar was different from usual. Alex thought that it might be some unknown ancient language, or it was suffocating in its own fire. Then the one-eyed creatures glued themselves to Alex's arm and merged with each other to hold back the blow. He immediately pulled his arm out, but the creatures, like cancer cells, began to devour his arm. Alex looked at the slimy creatures and began to speak. After all, he had given the order. But what is this? This is the first time I've encountered it. Then the dragon started hissing. No doubt I saw the return of a dead man to the world of the living, because the fact that a man can kill me is a lie. Alex started talking. So you can talk. Then why did you pretend to be a German? Suddenly the slimy creature ducked and stuck to his face. Alex didn't have time to orient himself, but felt the slimy fungus spreading over his body. He started to speak. The situation seemed to be getting out of control. 
Hey, dragon, why don't you tell me what's going on with you? Meanwhile, the Demiurge sat on a rock in front of the open area and watched the great battle. The dragon flying high in the sky breathed fire from time to time, which fell to the ground in the form of burning rain. Then Demiurge started to say why Alex is hovering. Hurry up and drop him. The spectators are waiting for him. Why are you fiddling with it? It's only one. After a few seconds, Demiurge shouted over do show what you can do. The beast of prey folded its wings and fell from the sky. Zeke raised his broom and began to speak. I've been ready for a long time. This dragon is not as big as I first thought. The Demiurge looking up into the sky began to say, Alex, you decided to slay the dragon without magic. If it doesn't die in the air, there's a good chance it will eat our hero. Hearing this, Zeke started to answer, but Sir Dems, I'm so young and I want to live. You promised me fame and fortune. Then the Demiurge turned his gaze to the boy and began to say that whatever happens, I will not let you die and remember once and for all, my word is law. Zeke didn't take long to answer. I believe your word, sir, and I put my name on the line, Dems. I believe in living to a ripe old age. At that moment, Zick felt his blood pressure rising. Heroic particles traveled through his veins and spread throughout his body. Blood boiled with the desire to tear the dragon to pieces. Zeke took a fighting stance and waving his broom furiously shouted, This is how I'm going to win. At that moment, Alex felt that the unknown creature began to devour his face. And without wasting time, he uttered the moonlight first chapter. The bright light coming from his eye began to cauterize the sticky roots. But the burnt creature began to crawl over his head. The smoke of the roast immediately dissipated. Then the creature glared menacingly with its one eye. At that moment, it tried to follow the movements of the demonic hands. After a few seconds, the hands that had small slime particles on them got out of control. Suddenly, eyes started to appear on the palms of the hands. Alex was surprised and said, I haven't fought with myself yet. I wonder who will win and started to attack the submissive outsiders. He decided to break their wrists and started to strike with the remaining hands. But the enemy blocked the attacks while sucking on its head like a leech. And soon it began to put its roots through the eye. Alex, realizing that the dragon was falling, started to say how much you have to take. By that time, the sticky fungus had already reached the brain and decided to take full control. Alex, feeling terrible pain, screamed hundreds of demon brushes. The leather cloak on his back cracked and dozens of new hands came out and immediately caught the strangers. After that, Alex uttered a thousand fervent whips. The leather cloak on his back cracked again, and sharp whips came out and started to cut off the infected and out-of-control hands. That's when Alex grew furious and caught the sticky creature. He tried to pull it off his face, but the roots were deeply embedded. The Demiurge, watching what was happening, began to say why he was approaching too fast. At that speed, this beast will tear down half the village. You'd better slow down a bit. You need to pick a place where you can land the dragon safely. I hope you're not stupid enough to kill all the villagers. But Alex was too busy pulling the nasty creature off his face. But worse, he lost most of his paws and couldn't change the trajectory of his fall. Alex saw that the ground was getting closer and felt the roots holding his brain. But the farther he pulled the sticky creature, the more the roots tore. Zeke heard someone shouting, Hey, the dragon is close. We'll all die like mice in a hole, save whoever can run. A child's voice was heard. Mom, tell me, is it always so scary to die? The girl who used to look out the window shouted, This snake will raise our houses to the ground. Hurry up and run to the basement. The Demiurge stood up abruptly and said, Alex, what are you doing? Slow down or you're disobeying me. The deal was, you kill the dragon, but I can see it's alive. But you don't have much time left. Hurry up and make things right. Zeke stood in a fighting stance with his broom in front of him and thought, I'm not running away. And even if I am deceived and die, it's better than living in the shadows of heroes. Clenching his teeth, he hissed, I'll defeat the dragon with one blow. At that moment, Alex's voice came from the sky, the moon's heat absorbing living tissue. Zeke's entire life immediately flew before his eyes. But there was one situation from his childhood that stuck in his mind. My father told me that the secrets of swordsmanship have been passed down in our family for generations. You must learn them and prepare for the Demon King's army to attack our world. Zeke answered, but I will not take part in the battle against the Demon King. The kids in the yard tell me every day that our family is not capable of such a thing. My father insisted that no matter what anyone says, our family has had the holy blood of heroes running through our veins for centuries. I'm sure you'll be a great hero and fight against the Demon King. Then my father coughed and went on to say, you just study hard. As long as I am alive, I will try to pass on my experience and teach you how to fight. 
Zeke smilingly replied, Well, Dad, I will definitely learn sword techniques and my sister will be my priestess and will help me with holy spells. Then Zeke came to his senses and began to say, If I run away, I'll have no peace day or night. He started swinging his broom while shouting my kindness was hurt and my soul was filled with the bitterness of undeserved insults. From the sky came the voice of Alex, the reaper of dark souls awakening. After these words, he managed to rip the sticky creature from his face. The demiurge, trying to see where the pilot was, began to say, now there will be an impact. Zeke saw that the open maw and darkened eyes of the dragon were just around the corner. He continued to strike, shouting, evil dragon, holy broom, will be the last thing you see. Before the collision, Alex stealthily walked into the black ball. With amazement and horror, the humans watched the huge beast sweeping away the wood on its way down. Dakon collapsed to the ground at the same time as the broom hit the ground. The ground shook and the windows of the houses flew out. Blue blood spattered in every direction. Zeke struggled to keep his balance, but a layer of blood and slime clung to his body. Meanwhile, streams of thick blood were spreading everywhere. And when he realized that he was able to resist, then... He gave vent to his emotions and began to shout loudly, I am alive and the sneaky snake is dead. I'm alive and he's a bubbling puddle. Then he continued speaking in a quieter and calmer voice. But how could this happen in real life? Did I get so angry that I lost control and actually killed the dragon with a single blow? But this slime mess stinks so bad I'm afraid I'm going to throw up. Suddenly a girl's voice rang out. The valiant brave stood up to the monster and in the end crushed it, saving our lives. People began to look out of the windows and the joyous roar grew. The hero had slain the dragon. God himself sent him. The holy hero saved us. The girl who used to laugh at him started shouting the loudest I love you unknown hero. Zeke's eyes opened wide at that moment he consulted with himself waiting for his heart's prompting. When his heart felt very warm he shouted, I am gray as a mouse but my strength is over the top. The demiurge coughed loudly so as not to attract people's attention. Zeke immediately looked at him. The demiurge started to say enough with the bragging. They're coming to get to know you. Why don't you change your clothes and hide, masked hero? Zeke jumped out into the middle of the blue puddle and turned to his master. I think I've had enough of this adventure for one day. I'm going to get cleaned up right now. Meanwhile, someone was watching from high above. Alex held onto the cracked wooden cross and looked down at the flames devouring the church. Then he looked with one eye at Zeke running down the main road in an unknown direction. At that moment, his head lifted and the horrible sight of a half-eaten face was revealed. Over his head circled the words, Dragon, I behold the return of the dead man to the world of the living. Then Alex shifted his gaze to the fire devouring the dead dragon's open mouth. The beast's ribs popped outward from the violent impact with the ground. Its stomach was ripped open and its entrails scattered all over the street. The action takes place the next morning. The demiurge wakes up and starts saying how well I slept. I wonder how long I've been in bed like a log. Footsteps were heard from the corridor, and when the mentor entered the room, he immediately started to say, You are already awake, master, have some coffee. Demiurge looked sleepy and started to say, You made me nervous yesterday, but today I'm in a good mood because I had a dream where I fought burning corpses and killed them all in another circle. Then he looked at the kettle and went on to say, Coffee is such a drink. To which Alex replied that people drink coffee in the morning to wake up faster. All of a sudden, Zeke came into the room and started to say, Sir, excuse me, something has happened. Demirge looked at the guy and started to say, Then report what news you have brought. Zeke told me that all the people of Zorix have gone in search of the masked hero. They want to make him the hero of the village. Then Damirg took a cookie and chewed it and started to say, You look like a bum. Your clothes are filthy where you got so dirty. Zeke scratched the back of his head and started to answer. The village is in such a mess after the battle I helped to clean up. The Demirge asked if you must have gotten up early. Tell me honestly, did someone make you do it or did you decide to do it yourself? Zeke replied, I decided to do it because manual labor pays well. Then the demiurge took a cup, took a sip of coffee and began to speak, which means that so far everything is going according to plan. The morning on the surface is quite nice. The tops of the trees are swaying so vividly in the breeze and this fresh air is so invigorating. I feel like my life is getting light and carefree. How good it is to get up under the rays of the invigorating sun and start my day with a cup of aromatic coffee. Alex immediately told me that this coffee is made from the dragon's tongue and his left eye. I'm glad it's to your liking. After that, he became interested in the noise downstairs and looked intently from the half-ruined hotel. There was a girl's voice. Oh no, my house, please, somebody help me. Then came a man's voice, stop whining. 
Demirge got out of bed and saw that the people downstairs were carrying boards and feeding them to the roof. The guy sitting on top of them was stacking them and nailing them down. All the villagers were working hard, but the man who had divided them into groups started shouting, Let's hurry up, or we'll be here all night. A girl brought a basket of bread and handed it out to the people, saying, Eat to give you strength. Zeke was picking up and carrying rocks, and when he was carrying a full box of stones on his back, the manager shouted fast, Zeke, there is a whole ton of the same stones. Alex started to say the men had more than a day's work to do. They are working so hard to rebuild this dreary village. Demiurge sat down on the edge of the wall with his legs overhung and started to say yes, and our expired one is puffing away. Then Alex went on talking. Yesterday he told me what a strange job he'd been doing since his early years. It's too expensive for a poor family to raise a hero. Zeke said he did laundry, cleaned and chopped wood. Then he worked in a shady bar. But to make more money, he even had to dig graves. Just to say what he did. The Demiurge started waving his legs around while saying, well, that's just the way he is. But I'm thinking about something else right now. The boy looked at the sea that seemed to have no end. Then he looked at the glistening waves and continued to say, okay, then I've decided. Since we've already found a hero and it's too hard for me to go around the world, we'll stay in this village. It's small and unremarkable, but I was hooked somehow. It's so beautiful and there's little creeled creatures flying overhead. This is where the Dem's human journey would begin. Then he stood up and cheerfully began to say, let's run and get out of Zeke's way. Alex asked the master, but where are you going? Demiurge started to answer, we are going to sell dragon skin naturally. It is needed for equipment and it costs a lot and I want to be in the top of the rich. Alex reluctantly replied that the skin was taken to the hero's bureau. Hearing this, the Demiurge shouted angrily, but how could they take it? Alex explained that ordinary people could not even lift the dragon's corpse, so the bureau took care of it. The Demiurge sat down with anger. He opened his mouth wide and started screaming, fuck, we killed the dragon for nothing. To which Alex replied, Master, don't open your mouth so wide you can see his guts. I don't think you should worry so much about some hide. Demiurge waved his index finger and said, let's go anyway. Alex asked, pardon me, sir, where you are going this time? Demiurge took a breath and in a hissing voice started to say, let's go to hell with the hero's bureau. Hearing this, Alex shouted with the voice of a hunted animal frantically searching for a saving trick. Please stop. This is the main base of all heroes. No matter how strong my lord is, fighting them alone is insane. There's a whole bunch of people out there with unimaginable power. Some of them use spells regularly. Others have light auras. And frankly, we have zero chance there. If they realize that the demon king has escaped from his kingdom, it will be the end of everything. Alex licked his lips with a long, pale pink tongue and making a cute expression continued talking master. You wanted to become a hero's companion. In the human world to become a hero, you have to register with the bureau. And if there's nothing left of him, how will everyone know Zeke is a hero? The Demiurge took hold of his bald beard and grudgingly said realistically, All right, let these heroes live a little longer. Alex exhaled easily and thought I just saved a race of demons from destruction. But the Demiurge turned around again and raising his index finger said that he was not going to give up so easily. Alex briefly asked what you had in mind this time. Demiurge stuck out his long snake tongue and slurred his words. I decided to restore our losses in the neighboring country. Then Alex started to speak. But you're a human Dems now. I'll be human from tomorrow, the guy hissed. Half an hour later, a wagon was already driving across the field. Alex sat in the front and steered the horses. Demiurge lay on soft hay and listened to birds singing with closed eyes. Alex got bored and like a parrot, he started repeating, my lord, let's go back to our dungeon. After the second repetition, the Demiurge opened his eyes and shouted angrily, you are disturbing me listening to these strange sounds. Then Alex started to speak, but you've been on the surface long enough. It's time to go back and the whole demon kingdom is waiting for your return. The big day is 20 years away and we can't waste any more time. You must complete the Demon King's training before you can take over the surface. My lord, you have been told since you were a child that the Demon King will come and attack the human world. The Demiurge deliberately covered his ears but still answered, That is your problem. I won't do it on your orders. But Alex insisted on his own. Everyone is already used to it and does not consider these words as a directive. 666 of your predecessors, the entire Demon Kingdom, and the people preparing for the attack, Take it as a given. Then the Demiurge put his hands under his head and began to say, if this is how things work, why do we need a god at all? It's a cool experience. Use your brain and get used to the fact that I am no longer the Demon King. 
Alex suddenly screamed, Pick any girl you want. You need a child to be the 666th king in your place. The demiurge jumped and immediately began to answer any maiden. How can you speak at a time like this? I can tell you're a demon. Shoo, get out of here, demon bad. Alex's disgruntled look flashed from under his black hat. Then he started to say, Well, I won't leave you until I have an heir to the throne. To which the demiurge replied, The decision is mine. But if you are so eager, I will make you my servant permanently. Alex's expression changed immediately. He smiled and began to say that he would like to find you a wife who would be perfect for you. Then Demir started to answer once again talk about marriage. I will tear the kingdom of demons with my own hands. Alex immediately turned his head and waved his rosette. The horses heard the sound of the rose splitting the air and pulled the wagon faster. The wooden wheels rumbled over the pits and Demiurge swayed in the hay like a log. The Demurge, trying to catch his balance, began to say, Can you go slower? I wanted to tell you what we did. Alex held the horses and asked, Sir, what you are talking about. Then Demiurge started to explain, Remember that slender girl with big eyes? Alex briefly replied, I don't remember, and there are many slender girls with big eyes in the human world. After a short pause, Demiurge continued to say, Maybe you remember that princess in a beautiful dress by the way I touched her and checked that she was without panties. Alex surprisingly started to reply, it must be a joke. I don't understand when you had time to put your hands under her dress. Then the demiurge blushed and started to speak, but you know my blood boiled then. I'd like to know about sex. But Alex made an incomprehensible look on his face and started to answer. But what exactly should I tell? Suddenly the demiurge started to shout, I'm asking about pregnancy. Can a man get knocked up by a demon? Alex immediately replied, Of course they can. Admit it, you used a spell on her and that's why she let it happen. Demir started to answer no, I think she just liked me. Then Alex started to explain that humans and demons have sex in the same way. Usually males have semen inside their scrotum, which goes into the uterus of females and then into the ovum. Then the woman carries the baby for 37 to 42 weeks. The Demiurge put his hand in front of him and making a disgusted face said that he had had enough of sexual enlightenment. Alex smiled and continued to speak. My lord, I understand you. You must be ashamed to hear such things. But if the lord wishes, he can slowly spread his sperm on the body of another man. In simple terms, it takes a woman much longer to carry a demon child. So merging with a man will result in pregnancy 99% of the time. If it's a deep kiss, it's a 50, 50 chance. A kiss on the cheek gets a girl pregnant 25% of the time. The demiurge grudgingly said that you can actually knock someone up with a kiss on the cheek. I got scared to go near people. And if the girl herself kisses the demon on the lips and with closed mouth, it also counts. Then Alex said that everything counts, even if a demon takes a woman's hand. The demiurge took heart and lay down on the hay at that moment. He thought, why do I need such a body? Demon family, I almost got into trouble and it's like I'm made to reproduce. After that, he started saying, it's so obvious I'm supposed to kill and procreate. The more I learn, the more I don't like this body. Alex didn't think twice, but it's your gift and you are the hope and salvation of our kingdom. God himself gave it to you. The Demiurge looked sadly at the sky and began to answer, I'm just a copy printed for the next 100 years. And then I'll burn in hell and what good will God be? I don't like everyone expecting something from me. You don't want to ask my opinion. Then the Demiurge looked to the side and saw that a girl was running towards them, and a few hundred meters away, there were robbers on horseback. They spurred the horses and turned to follow the girl. A stranger dressed in a short dress with a cleavage revealing her breasts. A few tens of meters away, but suddenly, a voice was heard. The girl with tears in her eyes started to beg, Please help me, I'm being chased by mountain bandits. Alex started to say the beautiful lady is in danger. Why don't you come and help me? The demiurge did not hesitate to answer. Yes, why do we need her? She will get pregnant from one more touch. Then Alex said, Who knows? Maybe it will turn out to be something good. Then Demiurge started to answer that she came out of nowhere. She is running to us and calling for help. Don't you think it is suspicious? Alex started to explain that the situation when a beautiful lady calls for help during a chase is the most popular cliché of the fantasy genre. What's unusual about it? Well, but the Demiurge was of a different opinion and started to say, no, look around, there is no tree where they came from. There's a forest, but it's in the other direction. And more importantly, you think they wouldn't have noticed us while they were running all the way. Alex, looking at the girl, started to say that you have nothing to lose. Take a beautiful lady. You say you'll burn in hell as it is. The Demiurge replied that it is convenient to chop heads from horses and why they haven't done it yet. 
huge shadows raising dust pillar already almost caught up with the girl. A joyful amazement shone on the face of the bandit who stretched out his hand to catch the poor girl. The demurge looked suspiciously at Alex and started to ask if you had arranged such a cheap room. Alex didn't hesitate to answer in what sense. Then Demurge continued to say that you created such a situation so that this girl would give birth to an heir to the throne for you. Alex grudgingly replied, that's what you think of me. I am the greatest strategist of the kingdom of demons. I would not even think of such a failure. Demurge began to say, well, let's say I believe you. And at that moment, a girl ran up and grabbed the wagon with her hands. Two streams of tears ran down her cheeks. She looked pitifully at the Demiurge and began to beg Sir Hero, I am being chased by mountain bandits, please help me. Then the Demiurge looked coldly at the girl and began to say, I am not a hero, but a companion of a hero, and I don't even know how to help you. Where did you come from? There are no people or houses here. Hearing this, the girl cried even louder and began to say, You know, I went to the forest for firewood and saw this gang. Then I decided to run across the field, but they saw me. The Demiurge answered without thinking about it that it's a man's job to go for firewood. To which the girl replied, You see, my father died a long time ago, so I have to carry and chop wood. Hero's companion, please help me chased by robbers. The guy started to answer, You see, we have a first-class squad. We are dragon hunters, so chasing is not our part. Then the girl turned her head a little, and when her face was hidden behind the hood, she started to say how dodgy you are. The Demiurge immediately shouted, Hey, I heard a bad word for me. Say it again. The girl looked with tearful eyes and started to answer what the fuck. Hero's companion, please help the weak girl. But the Demiurge insisted on his own first tell me what the word ram means, and then I will think about whether to help you. The girl lowered her gaze and began to say, ram is such an animal. Then the Demiurge answered, well then I am not offended because I am worse than an animal. Suddenly a heavy axe rumbled in the air. It flew a few dozen meters and stuck in the wagon. Then a voice was heard, hey kids. I've been slow enough as it is, time is running out. The chief bandit held his horse and continued to say it was time to check what you were carrying. And what's that outfit you're wearing? Have you come from the future? Then the demiurge unhappily said some piece of shit on a horse broke the wagon dear to my heart. Alex thought briefly and replied then, take action, sir. The demiurge said quietly that you will burn forever for this and immediately snapped his fingers and smoke flew out and enveloped the bandit's body. The frightened horse reared up on its hind legs and threw the rider out of himself. The bandit fell to the ground and the horse ran over him to save himself. Bone crunching was heard under the hooves. The bandit swayed on the grass and began to shout as hot as a hot fire, extinguish me quickly. Fear appeared on the faces of the bandits and one of them started to say his own horse trampled him. But look at him, he's burning with blue fire. The other began to say, I have water, we must save him. The demiurge replied loudly, he can't be extinguished. Ask whoever you want for help, but all magic is powerless here. You will burn forever and never die. This will continue until the end of the world. After saying that, he looked at the rest of the bandits and went on to say who was next. Who else to roast for the next eternity? The bandit in the front immediately turned his horse around and with shouts of I beg for forgiveness began to ride away. The others in fear of death immediately rushed after him. The last bandit shouted, wait for me. He's the devil. I don't want to burn until the end of the world. The girl looked at them with a smile. But when she heard these words, she started laughing happily. Demiurge looked at the girl and began to say, first you were crying, and now you are laughing like crazy. You are saved, you can go for a walk. The girl looked thankful and started to ask, wait. Sir companion of the hero, our temple was captured by mountain bandits. Now you've only seen a small group, but there are many more. You see, they have enslaved all the priestesses in our temple, and the sacred relic is missing. Please get rid of the bandits and save the temple, please. Meanwhile, the demiurge was picking his nose and after a long pause, reluctantly replied, no, this is too small for me. We have a lot to do today and you are taking up precious time. After that, he looked at Alex and ordered to go. Alex grudgingly replied, yes, master, go on business. But the girl kept saying you are dragon hunters. Perhaps you are a companion of the hero who wears only rags. The temple that the bandits took is needed by the dragons and the dragon god. This is a true golden dragon temple. If you drive the bandits away, we will reward you with a golden dragon helmet. The demiurge turned his gaze to his mentor and began to say, You're hovering, let's go. Heavy footsteps were heard on the stone steps. A man was climbing up the stairs with heavy breathing. The guy stood there staring off into the distance. 
After a few minutes, he began to say how beautiful it is here. The sun is already slanting to the west and shining in your eyes, so I advise you to hurry up. Alex asked the master why we didn't fly. I'm tired of carrying you. The demiurge briefly thought about it and replied, Come on, I can't fly. I'm not some demon king. Well, don't stop. We're not far behind. But Alex asked if you could get on my back like I should. My legs are going to fall off. The demiurge said that's how I was taught in the demon kingdom. Then the mentor said, But you are no longer the demon king. To which the demiurge replied, Make less sudden movements, or it's hard for me to keep my balance. You don't want me to fall off a cliff. Alex felt drops of sweat trickling down his face, but he kept on pulling. He was starting to sound really suspicious. This is the second time I've stopped for a few seconds to rest. She's been running nonstop for half an hour, but a man would have fallen off such a steep mountain a long time ago. Meanwhile, the girl hummed her favorite tune and walked up the mountain. When it became hot, she opened her cloak and her breasts, covered only halfway by her dress, rippled with each ascent. The demiurge looked at the girl and began to say that she was walking upward so vigorously that when the wind let down her short dress, I could see everything. Do you think priestesses always dress like that? Alex answered without thinking, and it's true that I can see her round shape. But it's suspicious because priestesses serve God, so they shouldn't behave like that. The demiurge started to speak, but I don't care who she is. I don't know what she's up to, but if she lies to me once, I'll scalp her and put it on me. The girl was climbing two steps at a time, and suddenly there was a ringing chant of the dragon god will save us. The true dragon god will keep us out of trouble. The demiurge heard the singing and immediately asked if dragons have a god. Alex, breathing heavily, began to answer no, just like you are worshipped in the demon kingdom. The true golden dragon is the chief among all the dragons. After that, he wiped the sweat off his face and continued talking. This girl at first glance seems fragile and weak. But she's very fast. I feel like I'm not keeping up at all, Demirj asked. But why she worships dragons? Then Alex started to explain my demons, dragons, and humans were created by someone many years ago. Every living creature has only one God. Only the one who created this world is the creator. But for some reason, God only loves humans. And dragons and demons are secondary characters to him. No doubt God is the only true love, and only he should be worshipped. Demons don't like him because he created hell and gave all the surface to humans. Dragons are too stupid to worship anyone. But humans have believed in him since creation and prayed to him. If we take over a place blessed with the light of the Lord, we will be his favorites. The demiurge looked up at the sky and began to speak a strange display of love. So God created us to put us underground. At that moment, Alex stepping over a step caught on a stone and started to fall. But before his face hit the ground, he said, We're here, sir. The demiurge watched the small stones roll down the steps. Then he stepped on Alex's head and walked forward and said, You're a weakling. Good thing I got my bearings in time and didn't roll down the stairs like those pebbles. Alex started to say sorry the last step seemed higher to me. The demiurge went to the entrance of the monastery and said, Lie down and rest a bit, and then you will drag me down again. Demiurge entered the monastery and immediately started to say, Hey priestess, where you rush so much? There are two of us and it's good that Alex knew the way. Alex caught up with the guy and began to say, Be careful, master, something is wrong here. But Demiurge did not pay attention to him and started to say, Where are the bandits and the slam of the true golden dragon? Bring it here while I am kind. There was a voice, I am here, and when a branching fire lightning flashed, then the silhouette of a girl on a high throne appeared. She lightly waved her slender bare foot and continued to speak. Finally you have arrived. Your lackey's intuition is better. The demiurge briefly replied that you are here instead of the brigands who took over the temple. So what's up with the golden dragon helmet? Then the girl nervously threw one leg over the other, and the precious stones and pearls made a barely audible clinking sound. At that moment she began to say, How dare you open your mouth? 564. You haven't realized what you've gotten yourself into yet. Now bow before you sits the goddess of all dragons, the rightful lord and mother of all dragons, the one true golden dragon. The golden law states that all who enter this temple must bow at my feet. Alex immediately took a step forward, and when he was close enough began to whisper in the ear of the demiurge, She is the true god of dragons. My lord, we are bound hand and foot. Seeing this, the frighteningly formidable girl laughed loudly and began to say, Silly mortal, you are so surprised because this is beyond your expectations. You're still unable to realize where you've come to. Suddenly the thick stone walls became red hot, 
Tongues of fire appeared on the floor and the temperature rose sharply. The demiurge scrunched up his nose and replied, So you are a dragon goddess. I am now in your fiery room. It's a nice place you have here, but I don't care. There was a glint of fire in the girl's eyes. She leaned in a little and said, You're finally getting the message. As an apology, you will do something for me. Meanwhile, the demiurge was looking somewhere off to the side and picking his nose. After not much thought, he started saying that, you are carrying the law of dragons, mother of dragons, or whatever you are. I want a cool nickname like that, too. Then he pulled his finger off his nose and turned to Alex and continued to say, I thought there was something missing from my name. The one looking out of the darkness is the one of the devilishly languid alphas. Do you think that's a good name for me? Alex started clapping his hands while saying, I would expect nothing less from you, my lord. Then the girl shouted, Stop this nonsense and beg for forgiveness. Don't you have anything to apologize for? Demirge looked at the ceiling, which was also shrouded in fire, and began to answer, I think I never did anything bad to you, and besides, I was recently released from prison. The girl pointed her finger at the Demiurge and started to say, You killed the dragon yesterday. I am the mother of all dragons. You killed my child. The Demiurge pointed his finger at Alex and said that he killed the dragon. Alex asked where the exit was. After that, Demirge looked at the girl and continued to say, So you made a big deal out of it. Only because of the dragon you are so nervous. But the girl sharply got up from the throne, and going to the guy began to say you are afraid. Beg me, but I'm not so cowardly. The girl's face stopped a few centimeters away. She looked into the bright red devilish eyes and continued to say, You killed my dragon and now you are trying to calm me down. You don't want to live anymore. We are now in the Golden Jade Kingdom. For such an insult I could kill you with one finger, you pathetic demon. Even the demiurge in this castle doesn't stand a chance against me. So if you want to live, fall on your knees before me. 666. Alex tried to hide from the fire and began to speak. We are in the Jade Kingdom. My lord, this is indeed the Golden Dragon's territory. We are inside its domain. It's dangerous to fight her here. Hearing this, the girl laughed happily and began to speak. Your footman is very erudite. Now fall on your knees and kiss my feet. Demiurge touched the girl's nose with his index finger and started to say, If you are a real golden dragon, I will need your face. Get ready because I'm going to skin your head. Then I'm going to poke out your eyes and have Alex use them to make coffee. And when I go to the bathroom by then, everyone will have forgotten it even existed. You know very well who I am, but you're still pushing yours. The girl started to say, How dare you insult the mother of dragons in the Jade Kingdom? But the Demiurge interrupted her, saying, First apologize for deceiving me. The dazzlingly beautiful and at the same time lost girl started to say, What are you talking about? I don't understand why I should apologize. The Demiurge calmly began to explain, I did not intend to annoy anyone here. I came to Earth to live quietly in the village and become a companion of the hero. But suddenly your child appeared and burned down the castle and left nothing of the houses. What are you supposed to do in that case? We had to defend ourselves. You didn't stop your dragon from destroying everything, but came when we were sitting still. Fooled us by pretending to be a shaman with your bandits, and now you're like, Ta-da, I'm a goddess, so apologize. And I'm supposed to bow down and say, God, God, dragon goddess, please forgive me. Since you're a dragon goddess, you can do whatever you want. All dragons are so cruel and irresponsible. Alex came closer and started talking, and he's right. It's arrogant to believe that you can do whatever you want just because you have power. It's only natural to stand up for someone for someone else's safety. Besides, the dragons were the first to violate the truce treaty. You should be the one apologizing to us. The Demiurge looked at Alex and started to say it's a good idea. Then he looked at the girl and continued to say, Dragon Goddess, you are ready to apologize to the people of Zorix. The girl held her head and crouched down in fear. Then the Demiurge approached and started to say, Listen, if a child has done something wrong, it is always the parent's fault. The girl looked at him with pitying eyes and started to say, I am not their real mother. Alex spoke loudly and said, you don't want to take responsibility for them, but you enjoy your power. The Demiurge continued, you've seen your golden kingdom. I realize children can be at fault. It's not always the parents' fault, because parents usually don't care about their children, but as soon as something bad happens, they stand up for their children. It's parents like you that get everybody in trouble. Alex said, you can't ignore it. You as a representative and goddess of dragons should apologize for breaking the truce because of one dragon. The girl scratched her head and lowered her gaze. After a short pause, she began to speak. Well, I guess she did. I feel like I've stumbled somewhere. Alex turned around and started to walk away. 
Demiurge followed him and started to say, Soon you will be punished. But now maybe you can let us out of here. The girl in a trembling voice started to say, Wait. When Demiurge turned her head, she continued to say, Since you are already here anyway, listen to my request. The Demiurge turned around and without thinking answered that you should be happy that I gave you life, and I think you should apologize first. The girl began to nervously stamp her bare feet on the floor. Then the Demiurge started to say, Don't get mad, so apologizing, you won't lose anything. Then the girl came closer and started to say, Excuse me, please. Demiurge stopped and the girl bowed low and continued to say I was wrong, and only now I realized all my mistakes. I'm ashamed that my dragon has done so much harm to people. Demiurge put his hand on the girl's head and started to say it's good that you realized it. But you didn't have to do that. But since you apologize, your apology is accepted. Then he started laughing and stroking her head. The girl started to say, well, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Because I'm generous. Stop making a mess on my head. The Demiurge started to ask, tell me what you want the dragon head for. The girl with the golden hair, how do you plan on fixing this? Then she leveled up and, looking serious, asked me to catch all the dragons to raise them. Demiurge again put his hand on her head and started to say, True golden dragon, the goddess of dragons, the law and mother, asked me, the king of demons, to catch her own children. Yes, catch them, please, replied the girl. Hearing this, the Demiurge started rubbing his hands through her thick and long hair while shouting at me that I'm a fool. It's obviously a trap and I have to believe you. You're delusional, little girl. The girl started to step back and make excuses. You've got it all wrong. But the Demiurge immediately caught her by her slim, slender waist and pulled her close to him. When the girl was close enough, he caught her by the neck with his other hand and started to chew on her cheek. Then Alex came up and started to say it was all because of the purple mycelium. It was on the dragon's body and it looked like a mushroom. It's something that seems to have taken over his consciousness. But what's more interesting is that this parasite even tried to take over my consciousness. The girl broke free from the Demiurge's grasp and started talking. It's the radicals who were against the truce signed with the humans. So the Demiurge asked what kind of radicals. The girl began to explain that the dragon in the village was their victim. Not so long ago, the radicals had suffered at the hands of humans. They grouped together and defended themselves as best they could, but eventually lost their women. The children of the radicals had been anti-human since they were children, so they went looking for weapons, and we still had to be neutral. A few years later, the radicals attacked the city while my peaceful child was nearby and was infected with this fungus. A little while later, this strange creature started appearing on other dragons. I think the radicals infected the dragons on purpose to spread the disease as quickly as possible. They have powerful magic I've never even heard of. So first, capture the dragon so innocent children don't die alone while they're used as weapons of war. The Demiurge started talking about it's called a hunt, but it's the chief radical who uses dragons to drive them mad or aggressive sending suicidal terrorists to attack humans. And you want me to catch them before they get to the humans, right? I already know this magic is high level because even Alex has had trouble with this creature. I don't think humans can beat that level of magic. At that moment, a red light shone in the Demiurge's eyes and he continued to speak, but the most important thing is what I get for it. For such hard work, there should be a proper reward. You will pay for my services. The girl furrowed her eyebrows and started to say, but what do you want? I don't have much wealth. Then the Demiurge began to speak, judging by your appearance starting from this golden, translucent dress that opens up to the glittering gems that cover your entire body. My request will be no harm at all to you. I want five dragon scales. You see, since ancient times, everyone believes that weapons are made from dragons. I'll take five dragon scales from each dragon I capture. You don't mind, do you? In addition, give me a thousand gold worth of weapons and armor based on the trade price which will improve the dragon's breath. What do you say? The girl leaned over to the guy and whispered, you're a real charlatan. The Demiurge began to speak, so the radicals were blinded by anger, and now they started a war between humans and dragons. Call me what you want, but if you want to solve the problem, I'll offer you a contract. At that moment, he snapped his fingers, and a piece of paper with text appeared. He went on to say the terms are Dems take the job, and the golden dragon pays for it. I will catch, I will punish the dragons that disturb the peace in the towns and castles of the people and bring them to you. The price of five dragon scales per dragon and weapons worth a thousand gold pieces will be paid by the morning of the next day after the task is completed. If you break the terms of the contract, you will become a slave of Dems. You will sign your name to the contract. The girl made a pitiful look and began to say, I see what you're getting at. I already feel like a slave. Then the Demiurge began to say, 
It's a deal with the devil, so read carefully. You're risking your own body and soul. The girl indignantly began to say the conditions for me frankly unfavorable. The demiurge did not think long and answered that you have only one option. If you do not want to, then solve your problems yourself. Then the girl began to say, I am a goddess of dragons, golden dragon agrees. The demiurge replied briefly, the contract is done. Then he turned around and started talking so much better. I see you can be nice if you want to be. Now open the door, we can do it in a couple of days. Then the girl grudgingly answered her the devil wait. Demiurge turned around and saw that on her thin waist like a birch tree hung a large diamante, and when she approached, the diamante reflected the light. The girl stopped a few meters away and continued to say, where are you looking? My eyes are higher. Listen carefully, you must bring the dragons to me alive. Enough deaths because I only want to help them. Then the demiurge looked deep into the girl's eyes and began to say, I will try to bring them alive. But if this creature has already eaten their brains, I will send the dragons in pieces. After that, Demiurge turned around and headed for the exit, followed by Alex. When they came out of the Jade Kingdom, the Demiurge started to talk, but everything is still on track. He started to go down the stairs and stopped abruptly and started to say, Oh shit, I forgot about the most important thing. Then he turned around and ran back. Alex started saying, What are you doing, Master? Please don't go there anymore. You said you gave her life. But Demiurge did not pay attention to the mentor, and when he ran inside, he started shouting, Dragon Goddess, wait, we haven't finished. But the big stone door had already closed. When the Demiurge saw that the road to the door was all overgrown with thorny bushes, he began to shout that she had not given me the true golden dragon helmet, and we can't go back now. Alex explained in a calm tone, we can't go back to the golden jade because we are not dragons. The Demiurge said from the sly-ass dragon, she tricked me again. Returning to the wagon, the Demiurge said, Now I regret looking at that big shiny stone hanging around her waist. I guess that's why I forgot the most important thing. But the day would come when I'd leave her face skinless. Alex, breathing heavily on his own, dragged his master downstairs. Then they got into the wagon and headed for Zorix. But the Demiurge dreamed of becoming an arms dealer all the way. After a few hours, they made it to their penthouse. Zeke was waiting for them at the hotel and immediately followed them to the apartment. Then the Demiurge decided to announce that he wanted to become an arms dealer. Alex blushed with anger and started to shout how you could think of such a thing. So you left the underworld to sell weapons on Earth. Zeke, who was watching, started to say, Alex, don't yell, so please, it's a good idea. Anyway, it's a lot better than hauling rocks from early to late like me. The Demiurge shouted angrily at his mentor. You didn't realize it when you heard that people hunt dragons and make weapons out of them. That's business, you brainless moron. The golden dragon gives us a monopoly on dragon scales. Oh my God, I'm going to make a lot of money. It just hit me. No, I'm already top rich. The beautiful goddess will give me whatever I need for the dragons I catch. It's a real freebie. There's a war every 100 years, which means the arms business will never fail. Alex got down on his knees and started begging me not to do this. You hear me? Without the devil, there will be no war. Come to your senses. Your plan doesn't solve the problem. It only makes things worse. The Demiurge showed his tongue and snorted like you don't know me, asshole. You may think with your empty head that dragons are caught for free. We'll get a good reward and more from the sale of weapons we can sponsor the real plan. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life as a businessman. You remember my new nickname, Deep Darkness Watching from the Darkness. And besides, I'll have all the weapons in the world. Then Alex smiled and started to answer. Everything is happening just as I wanted it to. What is necessary, you have not forgotten the underworld. Demiurge ordered so quickly, grab the stale and find us a store. Alex caught Zeke under his arms and shouted so much better, I'm listening to the seer. Then he ran over to the hole in the wall and started to say, sorry, I didn't get it the first time. Demiurge pointed his finger to the exit and started to say, jump up here. It's not high. After that, Demiurge rubbed his hands and quietly whispered, why should I run a business because my true goal is to build a house? The best one in the whole fantasy world. Then he lay down on the bed and thought, well, Alex is so stupid and I can manipulate him easily. But will he be able to find a good place to live? Luckily, he has Zeke with him and he's local and will help this asshole. The Demiurge looked through the hole in the roof at the blue sky where small velvet clouds were slowly passing by. The sun's rays warmed his body pleasantly. And when he closed his eyes, he saw the cross that stood on top of Dacoma Castle. Suddenly, it was torn apart by a violent explosion and then a jewel fell out of the cross and began to shatter into thousands of small pieces. Then he saw Zeke blushing with shame who said, Unfortunately, I'm just a rank P overdue. I dream of being a hero, 
but the reality is that I do my best to earn food. Then the Demiurge remembered how Alex heroically fought the dragon. He smiled when the picture of a golden-haired girl dressed in a gorgeous dress that was covered with pearls and shiny stones from the neck to the bottom of her chest appeared in his mind. A voice rang out in my head. Help the poor girl, I'm being chased by bandits. After that, the ram is such an animal. I can crush you like an insect, you pathetic demon. The Demiurge opened his eyes and noticed that sometimes birds flew over the broken roof. At that moment, he thought, now I have a steady income and a hero idiot. That's enough. I'll just sit back and be rich. The dragon goddess thinks I'm pathetic. I'll have to ask Zeke what he thinks of me. Somehow, I think people are all the same. What's so empty inside? Blood and carnage. Maybe I'd feel better if I killed and destroyed everyone in this village. At that moment, the Demiurge felt the presence of dark forces. He looked toward the door and saw thick smoke billowing into the room and extinguishing the burning candle. Then he listened, and a low voice hissed, Kill them all. Destroy this world. A solid darkness came over the whole room, and from the depths of the darkness, the heavy footsteps of the demonic army could be heard. Hundreds of thousands of gray figures crawled out of the ground and their glowing eyes flickered like flashlights. Thunder cracked overhead and fiery bolts of lightning struck the houses and churches built by the humans. The wind roared and the roar of the wind was mixed with the wild howling of the flying demons that had escaped from the underworld. The Demiurge listened and a growing voice began to say, enslave these people, create hell on earth, then you will complete your journey of rebirth and your death every 100 years under the earth where the sun no longer shines. At that moment, he wondered if the night had come so quickly or if my eyes were failing. You better shut up and let me sleep. After a few seconds, he noticed that the darkness seemed to have thinned. His vision was returning. And then he saw a white line flying across the sky and recognized its silvery glow. Half an hour later, loud footsteps were heard. The guy walked around the stone that had broken through the wooden floor and started to say, Here it is. We're already there. The last rays of sunlight illuminated a two-story house with a broken roof. Then the guy went on to say, This is your new gun store. The owners died in a dragon attack, and it was cheap. The Demiurge stood on the wooden steps and looked at the cracked walls. Then he sighed and began to say, That'll do. And you found him quickly. I didn't get much sleep. Alex was making nice with his new purchase and started to say when I found out about the real plan, I was so excited I couldn't sit still. The Demiurge didn't take long to reply that we're moving fast on this plan. Then Alex started to say that this store would look good if Zeke took it over. The Demiurge asked in surprise, but there is half a roof missing and how Zeke could fix it. Alex started to explain. Zeke told me he used to be a carpenter. That means that it's not a problem for him to make a roof and floor the walls. The Demiurge didn't hesitate to tell me how cool he was for his age. After that, he looked at his mentor and started to ask, but isn't the blood passed from generation to generation and pure bloods can have children not only of P rank? Alex started to answer even on the contrary. There were cases when a P rank and holy blood had the last hero in the family. The Demiurge started to speak so it's as the cards fall. The procrastinator has nothing to hope for if the family is of rank P. Then they must have a child of rank P. I see how the guy is trying and now he felt sorry for him. At that moment, Alex took the small brim on his hat with his hands and bent it upwards. After that, he smiled and started to explain that it's also ambiguous, not skill, but property is inherited. A family that often gives birth to high-ranked warriors or saints will have as much wealth as the king himself. For that kind of money, you can raise the level of a hero or the level of blood in various ways. Demiurge began to speak from the other side. In a family of rank P, it is difficult to shine with money even if the child has a higher rank. Alex didn't hesitate to answer correctly. And if Zeke said he's a P ranker, then he's already been recognized as a hero. My lord, I think it's unnecessary to show pity to people. The Demiurge started to ask if you know what I'm thinking. Alex immediately answered, I don't know. Suddenly, Demiurge stretched out his hand and grabbed Alex by the neck, and with the other hand, he flattened his perfectly styled hat. Then he stuck out his double tongue like a snake and hissed, What kind of demons are you that fall at the hands of those whose heroism is determined by the miserable availability of money? You are some uneducated morons. Alex, in a hurt voice, began to say, But sir, we are only following orders. You realize that we have a stupid beast sitting at the top. After that, he looked at his brimmed hat and put it back on his head. Demiurge reddened with anger, showed his lower fangs, and began to say, Let's not talk about it anyway. The world of demons is already in the past. 
Maybe you can tell us where our hero merged. Meanwhile, in the new catering company with a small assortment of dishes, work was in full swing. Plates of food were being served to the customers. Zeke was in the middle of preparing various dishes. The guy who got a whole plate of food immediately started eating. Zeke saw the mysterious friends approaching and smiled broadly and began to say, Master, you are already awake and now you have come to me for breakfast. Demirge came closer and began to say why you suddenly started selling noodles. Zeke replied that he had some time at night so he thought he'd make a little money. Although it's not much money, it's better than wasted time. The Demiurge put his hands on the table and began to say, Chef, give me a cup of noodles. Zeke didn't think long and replied, Master, give me two minutes. Then he took the hot pasta and threw it into the empty plate. Deftly, he picked up a knife with a wide blade, vigorously sliced the vegetables and placed them on top. Then he took a pot and poured hot brine over it all. Demirge watched carefully every movement of the cook, and when the dish was ready, he started to say if it was noodles. Zeke handed over the plate and began to say, Try it, sir, and I will make a second batch for Alex. The Demiurge looked at the contents of the plate and started to say, But how to eat it with your hands? Zeke thought briefly and replied, Take the chopsticks, sir. The Demiurge swallowed the pasta almost without chewing. After that, he smelled the empty plate and started to say, Oh, how tasty, I've eaten these noodles faster than Zeke cooked them. Alex started to say how good it is. I want to try it too. By that time, Zeke had already finished cooking the second portion and served the plate. Alex immediately pounced on the food like a wild animal. Then the Demiurge started banging wooden sticks on the table and asking for more. But Alex paid no attention to the guy and aggressively shoved the noodles into his mouth. Zeke smiled and started to say, now I'll make you a refill, just wait a minute. The Demiurge looked at him with a grateful look and started to say, why do you need to be a hero better cook the noodles? Zeke replied without hesitation. I'll take that as a compliment. Thanks to you, I was able to buy uniforms for my younger brothers for warrior school. It's a shame that it's just the two of them who go there without one. The brothers pretended not to care, but I know how happy they were about the money. The Demiurge with his mouth full started asking if you sent them to warrior school. Zeke started to answer, yes, maybe it's presumptuous of me, but I sent them to a private elementary school for warriors. I may not be strong enough, but I'm sure they will become real heroes, so I'm investing in them. Suddenly, a man's voice came from a neighboring table. Look, there's a fly floating in my soup. Zeke immediately stopped talking and looked at the customer in confusion. The guy sharply took a plate and spilling brine on the table began to shout, I did not want to eat in this hole, but I was hungry and came in, and that here I was poured. It's true what my girlfriend said about not going into this dump. Zeke immediately started making excuses. It was just a misunderstanding. Sorry, but we don't have flies, and the kitchen is perfectly clean. The guy threw a plate. But Zeke had time to cover his face with his hand, and then the plate hit his hand and all the contents started flying out. The Demiurge felt a few drops of brine land on his cloak. Then he saw that one pasta was on his shoulder. Meanwhile, the guy angrily started shouting, You think I'd lie? You know who my father is. One word and he'll shut you down right now. Zeke, afraid of losing his income, started talking. Now I'm going to make you and your girlfriend some new dishes. Maybe you don't like the noodles. I'll fry you some fish. The guy looked at Zeke angrily and began to reply. First you made me some vomit, and now you probably want to sell me rotten fish. Well, wait a minute. He seems to be from the holy fat family who thinks he's worth something. All people immediately noticed the chef with the noodles hanging from his head. The blonde gave out a hysterical laugh and started saying, Oh my God, that's the holy fat family. I know them. They still live here. The guy hugged his companion and began to say that it seems that this beggar has decided to make some money. After that, he looked at Zeke and continued to say, Now, tell us how long ago the heroes became chefs. Zeke reluctantly started to answer, I'm not wholly fat. My last name is Sviatochi. The guy kept talking. I remembered it's a poor family. Their father used to come to our house and beg for a job. And now his little bastard is selling slop on the street. So the son's as much of a loser as the father. The blonde standing next to him started saying, Look at him. He's an abomination. He's a hero too, but he's a macaroni hero. At that moment, the Demiurge turned around and started saying, I think it's a fly buzzing. Zeke immediately started begging Dems, please don't. I don't care what they say. Understand they are rich and they are used to doing this to ordinary people. The guy looked at the Demiurge and started to say, you called me a fly. Maybe you're tired of living. Judging by your clothes, you're as poor as he is. The Demiurge raised his hand and spread his fingers wide and began to say, you stained my cloak. The problem is that I didn't have time to pack my things when I left home. And besides, you hurt my subordinate, and such actions are unforgivable. 
The guy made a disgusted face and started talking. The problem with you is you're a pauper, and you've probably never owned a decent piece of clothing. Maybe you want me to tell my father that you're threatening me. The demiurge looked indifferent and began to say that you've signed your own judgment. Let's kill a couple gnats. And then his palm clenched into a fist, and the guy fell to the floor with a clatter. The blonde looked at her companion who was lying on the floor and screwed his eyes up. She saw that his hands and legs were trembling convulsively and screamed in a hoarse voice, Help me, I think my boyfriend is dying. But people didn't pay attention to the screams and were quietly eating pasta. Then the girl left her boyfriend and started running to save her skin. At that moment, the demiurge stretched out his hand again, and in the palm of his hand appeared a black ring. Then he began to say, I told you to kill a few gnats, and the clap was only one. The second rune is for you. After these words, the girl fell to the floor and began to hiss and wriggle like a snake. Demiurge calmly said, Now you will hiss until you choke on your own saliva, and your boyfriend will shiver until he dries up like a chub. People who don't respect heroes who risk their lives for them don't deserve to revel in the earth. Then the demiurge turned and continued eating spaghetti. All the people looked surprised. One man started to say this brave man defended the poor guy. A girl sitting at a neighboring table started talking, and he wasn't afraid of those rich people. Zeke started to say, Dems, you didn't go overboard with the punishment. To which the demiurge replied, I use the weakest runes, and that's a plus. Suddenly a piece of paper flew into his plate. Demiurge looked around and began to say the same message, wondering where it came from. Then he started to read of seen a dragon in Leah Castle go there immediately signed Yulgum. Then he smiled and started saying, Overdue, close your restaurant. We have our first mission for a VIP customer. Let's go make some money. Zeke immediately replied, Yes, sir, but I'm all dirty. I have to clean myself up first. High above shone a clear month and its whitish light glittered the bare rocks. The clatter of hooves and snuffling echoed. A pair of horses galloped near a cliff face. Alex guided the horses along the sandy road toward Leah's castle. Zeke, in his underwear and with a pot on his head, sat in the front and silently clutched his broom. Meanwhile, the demiurge made himself comfortable in the back. He put the hay under his head and picking his nose began to speak. I don't know if you'll believe it or not, but when I look at Dem's Nim, I somehow become much more confident. I think a dragon is an easy thing for our hero to do, Zeke answered briefly, but I'm sure I'll be scared when he's in front of me. Then the demiurge went on to say, I like your admonition to keep thinking that way. Alex turned to Zeke, despite your opinion of yourself, the master has chosen you as his hero. Live your life as you wish, but during adventures, you are our leader, so be brave. Zeke started to answer, yes, I understand, and I'll be honest, I'm trying to overcome my fear all the time. Alex smiled and started to say, your voice is too quiet for a leader. I'll work on it, Zeke replied. After a few minutes, Alex started talking. We are almost to Leah's castle, there is only one way, and soon this winding road will lead us to the place. The wagon rattled its wheels under the starry canopy of the night, and soon they turned, leaving the cliffs behind them. Zeke craned his neck forward as if trying to get a better look, and there he was. But it's so huge. A huge black creature sat spreading its wings near the faintly illuminated smooth and ice-covered castle. By then the dragon twice as tall as the domes hugged the tiny domain with its tail, as if the castle had always belonged to it. From time to time the head turned on its long and thick neck, and four bright lights flickered. Four eyes that blinked in the moonlight and then closed. Do you think he can see us? Zeke asked. I don't know, Alex answered quietly, but I don't think so. The dark mountains do a good job of hiding even friends from view. Then why is he looking at us directly? Zeke asked again. You have nothing to be afraid of. I'll take care of him soon, said Alex. Zeke kept asking if the dragon had already taken over the castle and where are all the inhabitants. Alex started to explain that in a castle of this size, there must be G-rank warriors, so everyone managed to escape. What a relief, Zeke replied. The demiurge said the stage is set, and all the spectators and gawkers have already gathered. Showtime prepare legendary procrastination. High up in the mountains, the freezing people were panicking. The man folded his Deloney and began to speak. I'm cold with sweaty clothes. I'm afraid we're about to freeze to death. I can't feel my arms and legs anymore. God, please save us. The guy standing behind me started yelling, handing out blankets only to the wounded. Don't scatter. Stay close to each other. Or better yet, huddle together. The man with his arms folded looked up at the sky and asked desperately, God, have you really left us? The guy standing at the side started to say quietly, Stop grumbling. If God existed, he wouldn't allow such a thing. The man replied without thinking, I don't know about God. 
but the king has definitely abandoned us and now lives on his own. A few miles from the castle, the king and his army hid in the valley of the mountain knot. The strongest mage raised his bloody hand and created a barrier to keep out the cold. The priestess used the heat of her aura and warmed the air. The fat and always dissatisfied king started to talk about how hot it was in the steam room. What happened to the heroes who went to the fortress to rescue someone? Tell them to come back here quickly. The mage hesitantly began to speak. It seems they are all frozen in the ice. I cannot contact them. The king began to shout, do something. I'll go crazy if I stay here even a second longer. Meanwhile, a pair of horses were galloping across the valley. Zeke put his broom in front of him, trying not to fly off the wagon. The king immediately began to speak, and there was the hero. The king, drenched in sweat, looked up, and the wagon was flying through the barrier above his head. At that moment, he started to shout, Hero is a skinny little guy. Go to hell. That beast will eat you to death. Suddenly, the mage's nose and eyes were bleeding. He fell to his knees, trying to hold the barrier. Suddenly, the spell broke like a broken chain, and the horses sped past the spies, their icy eyes glistening with malice. 747. There was a cracking sound and the wagon hit the ground with its wooden wheels, almost crushing the king. The surviving king shouted wildly, He's a pervert who rides around in his underwear. He's leaving. Catch him. Then he looked at the magician and continued shouting, Now I'm cold and now you can conjure something. The mage stood on all fours and replied in a tired voice, Yes, I will fix the barrier. The king looked at the quickly receding carriage and started shouting, How dare you fly over the emperor? I hope the dragon kills you and who are you anyway? A group of men stood knee-deep in snow on a rocky ledge and prepared to die. They had to decide quickly what to do, but the freezing cold was chilling to the bone. The mother hugged the boy, hoping to warm him up a little. Suddenly the boy saw a wagon heading towards the castle and spoke loudly and looked where the king was hiding. There was movement. I see a couple of horses. 752, the dragon hissed, thinking he saw them. Meanwhile, the winged beast turned its head and hissed in a chilling voice. It was trying to find the inhabitants of the castle. The man began to speak softly. They say dragons are very good at hearing. If it realizes we're here, we're dead. You do realize it'll be impossible to escape quickly in deep snow. But I'm surprised at the resilience of that guy. He seems to be unclothed and holding some kind of weapon. I'm sure this brave man will soon freeze to death. Suddenly the wagon wobbled. Zeke lost his balance and fell on the bench. The bone-chilling wind forced him to brace his arms and legs. Alex began to speak understandingly. We appreciate your hard work. Silhouettes of frozen men stood on the icy half-long hangings of the unknown mountains. The horses reared high in terror, raised their hooves, gave a long rumble and rushed forward. But farther down the road were several dozen stiffened dead bodies. It was clear from the silhouettes that the men had died in blinding horror. The wagon pulled out of the thick snow towards the castle. Alex chose to go east, bypassing the icy rocks on the road. The obstacles were bypassed successfully and stealthily. The dragon that had taken over the castle became visible at close range. The horses snorted and betrayed the shami, but Alex sat motionless and watched the road. Demiurge looked at Zeke and started to say we do the same thing as last time. Alex catches the dragon and tosses it to you. You swing your sword like you did then and the end is clear. Zeke, you're like an insect to a dragon, so watch out. Especially you, Alex, don't repeat past mistakes. Alex didn't hesitate to answer. I know what you're talking about, but this dragon is much bigger than the past. I'll do the dirty work and the valiant hero will wait downstairs. Alex raised his hand and when he straightened his finger, a dark ball appeared. Then he continued to say, Don't worry, master. You know, the thicker and blacker the darkness, the more horrible I look. The demiurge replied without hesitation, fighting at night is much more comfortable, I agree. So come on, I want to hear the wild yelling and watch the fight. But don't kill him. Catch him alive. I don't want to upset the goddess at the first job and a corpse of this size is of no use. Alex flashed a fierce look and started to answer last time I was confused when I faced the unknown. Then I'll kill the dragon in half. I'm not going to take too long and you'll see for yourself. Zeke's trembling voice started to make me feel cold and scared at the same time. Alex turned to the guy and immediately answered, this dragon is so big so I'll make some noise. But remember, if you want to live, you better keep your head down, or you'll be one of those who couldn't escape and froze to death before you know it. Be sure you don't have to be afraid of the darkness to be famous. By then, the dark ball had grown to human size and Alex jumped into it. Zeke shouted, But I'm afraid of the dark now you scared me even more. Demiurge yawned and started to say something I'm bored. I'll try not to fall asleep. Take your weapons and run and fight the dragon. But first slow down the wagon. 
After stopping, Zeke looked at the dragon and began to say, Mr. Dems, I'm not sure that a broom is going to make it through this ordeal. You can come with me. I think I'm going to pee my pants. I was predictably startled to see him in front of me. The purple mycelium sat motionless on the dragon's head. It had long ago taken over his mind. A multitude of unclouded eyes stared into the distance in amazement. A black ball appeared in the moonlit sky, and Alex, who had suddenly emerged, immediately focused his gaze on the fungus and thought to try to crush you with a swoop. The fungus-like creature saw Alex and immediately signaled to his brain. There was no expression on Alex's flat face or in his bright eyes, but his voice sounded sullen. On the way, I counted the stars in the sky and the people in the dark. At last we have met, and if you are naughty, I will have to count the slain dragons. The dragon raised its head, flashed its sharp fangs, and opened its mouth wide. Alex suddenly released his hands and changed the trajectory of his fall. Meanwhile, the dragon snapped its jaws loudly without catching anything. Alex grabbed the wing of the beast and sharply turning around began to approach the head. Long arms clung to the scales moving the body forward. Suddenly the beast spread its wings, emitting a stench. It exhibited a jagged nibble and claws. By then, Alex had already reached the malignant fungus and immediately launched a series of magical strikes. Zeke watched with his mouth open, watching the bright megodling in the sky. And when he heard the flapping of wings, he felt anxiety squeezing his heart and fear tugging at his soul. At that moment, a loud cracking sound echoed from the castle. Zeke shuddered and began to say nothing could be seen behind the smoke, but the battle had already begun. We need to find a place where Sir Alex can see me. Suddenly there was a rumble and a thud. The demiurge began to speak. I can see well now the dragon landed and crushed the gate near the castle with his paws. Then he put his hands under the hay and continued to say, I think you forgot something and be thankful I hid it under my hay. You carried it around all the way, saying that every hero should have a shield. It's in memory of your father. The demiurge held up his index finger as if aiming, followed by a bright splash. Zeke shielded himself from the unexpected blow and immediately looked at the purple flame of the shield. Then the demiurge went on to say, this is a protective barrier that can withstand the dragon's breath. So off you go, our legendary Alex has already started the fight. Zeke replied shortly, I thought it had gotten out during our stormy ride. Now I have nothing to fear and thank you for being so considerate. Despite the sub-zero temperature, the demiurge closed his eyes and fell asleep immediately. Zeke thought, but how can you sleep in this environment? So he jumped off the wagon and thought, sleep well, Mr. Dems. I'll be perfect this time. I must hurry so Sir Alex won't have to wait for me. He ran a few dozen meters and looked around thinking I need to find a very conspicuous place somewhere high and in the middle. And over there I need to get there as fast as I can. I hope this ice mountain is strong and won't fall on my head. Looking up at the top of the mountain, Zeke caught on a boulder and lost his balance. In an instant, his legs separated and his fall was sudden. At that moment, the guy realized he was sliding down the ice and the situation was out of control. Alex, being in the air, continued to make magical blows. His eyeballs exploded loudly, spraying slime mixed with purple blood. Then he landed in the center of the purple mycelium and walked forward and began to poke his eyes out. At that moment, he spoke. The crackling sound soothing to me. My claw of death is much stronger than human steel. I will gladly destroy all the hordes of maddened eyeballs. The dragon waved his head, and then there was a fierce, deafening roar, followed by a wave of shivering cold from his open mouth. Alex was under a barrage of attacks. The dragon spread its silver-black wings and began to fly away. Alex thought I haven't lost my strength and I am still frightening and powerful, but it seems the formidable opponent is trying to leave the battlefield. Victory will not be missed and will not slip out of my hands at that moment. A demonic hand followed him and soon the fingers were gripping the fang with a dead grip. Alex flew off with the dragon while screaming at me. Even a demon king couldn't escape and you're trying. You're going to pay for mutilating my face. The punishment will be appropriate. Then he put his foot down and started to approach. In an instant, a heavy blow shattered the ice on the dragon's head. A second blow broke several fangs. Alex said aggressively, but you have already realized that you can't fight me. Now it's time for the black sting of terror and despair, which will be a worthy opponent for you. At that moment, the dragon tried again to devour his opponent, but Alex bounced back and quickly regrouped, saying how fast and tough you are. I'll be honest, I'm getting tired, but I'm persevering. Your size doesn't scare me at all, so my black stingers are going to take care of you right now. You're probably too dumb to realize I'm not coming back without my prey. Zeke watched carefully as the waves swirled and froze into icy foam. He barely saw the scales on the huge tail glisten. Then a loud clapping sound echoed as the tail hit the nearby rocks. 
Then Zeke decided to find a more comfortable place and headed forward with his brush into the snow. The wooden shield shrouded in violet-blue smoke shone like the sun. There was a strong wind blowing from the sea, but Zeke kept covering his body with the shield to keep in the warmth. 805. He started talking about how cool it was to watch. I can't even stand here and Sir Alex is fighting a dragon all by himself. How does he survive, and is he really a D-rank hunter? People saw the glittering shield, and the noise in the crowd grew. A guy started talking about how this pervert, who doesn't even have proper armor, thinks he can resist with this wooden shield. The guy standing next to him thought briefly, and replied that he was a hero. Stand back, I can't see and now we're already saved. The man who was praying all the time started to say, Understand this guy has undressed on purpose to support us morally. He came to save us. God has heard our prayers. Meanwhile, the king heard a growing noise and started to say, So this is really a hero, and I thought it was some kind of suicide. My magician and priestess are of little use. The emperor began to shout, Brave man who knows no fear, please save the remains of my castle. A ringing voice immediately reached Zeke's ears and he turned his head and began to speak. It turns out everyone is supporting me. I must take matters into my own hands and stand my ground. I also have to be more careful because I slipped a few meters from the cliff. People's voices became more audible. He is a real hero and does not shake standing far away from danger. That magic shield says the guy's high ranking. Zeke thought, I want to be like Alex. Saving people and giving them hope. I have to conquer my fear of the dark and become a real hero. Suddenly Zeke felt something change. The wind blew in his face and said, please help us, please help us, we are dying. He walked over to the cliff and saw two frozen silhouettes standing motionless in the ice block below. The guy hugging the girl froze with his eyes open, but the girl covered with a rough layer of ice did not lose hope and asked for help. Suddenly, it was as if a bolt of lightning had burst out of the ground and split the foaming ice. A blinding flash illuminated the black and white castle for a moment, and the dragon's tail flashed with a silver blade. Before the darkness closed in, Zeke saw the dragon's tail strike Alex, who began to fly away. Then the ground shuddered with a heavy crushing rumble. He felt the ice cracking under his feet and straightened up, trying to fight his fear. Alex's flying was stopped by an icy rock. At that moment, he felt the ice crack and shatter from the impact of his body. He wasted no time getting to his feet and straightened up. A black stubby hand was clutching the eye he had torn out. Alex thought he missed one blow, but still, my paw managed to tear out one eye. The paw as if heard his thoughts and aggressively began to smash the eye against the exposed piece of rock. At that moment, the dragon opened its toothy maw and hissed as if it felt pain. A thought appeared in Alex's mind that magic is really on a high level because even a torn off piece of fungus maintains a connection with the host. At that moment, the predatory beast flashed a chilling eye and noticed where Alex had fallen. The black barbed hand tried its best. It first pounded the eye against the rock, and when the retina ruptured, the hand clenched into a fist and continued to crush the flattened eye. Alex looked at his paw and started to say enough. The eye had already come out. 820, I only gave you freedom in case the fungus took over my brain, so you could take partial control and help me. Then he looked at his opponent and began to say, yes, you are basically a dragon zombie. Then he looked at the remnants of the purple mycelium that was stuck to the dragon's head and began to say, you will continue to regenerate until your master dies. Because of these parasites, we have to change the battle plan. And if we can't kill the dragon, there's only one thing to do. Cut off all its limbs. The predatory beast registered Alex's voice as a sign of attack and rushed forward with sharp teeth. Alex immediately planted his heel on the exposed rock for better contact with the ground. He got into a fighting stance and began to speak a hundred demon brushes. Suddenly, the leather cloak on his back cracked and a hundred long arms broke free. The mighty and heavy dragon pressed its wings to its back and gained acceleration, crushing obstacles on its way. Alex said loudly now one giant arm. At first glance, it looked like hundreds of festive ribbons folded together. Starting from the back, the weave grew upwards at an incredible speed. The formation of the huge dark arm ended at 50 meters. Meanwhile, Alex followed every movement of the dragon, and just before the collision, the giant hand struck a blow, hitting centrally the skull of the ravenous beast. The ground shook from the heavy, crushing blow. The crunch of broken bones followed. Alex angrily spoke a hundred armed hands, infernal hammer, and immediately a barrage of attack fell. Fists like hail from the sky began to deliver heavy blows. The hard bones struck at a different angle each time. 
But the dragon fought back and after each blow tried to raise its head while its fangs fell to the ground. Alex decided to rip the purple mycelium from its head, but the huge fingers encircled the whole head. The dragon immediately saw the opportunity and with its mighty paws managed to stand up. Then Alex let his head go and immediately grabbed him by the neck. Huge fingers instantly clenched. Alex clutched with a dead grip and a loud crack of breaking scales was heard, but the dragon was not going to give up so easily. At that moment, he got a signal in his brain and opened his mouth and let out a jet of icy foam. Zeke heard a noise that rolled across the plain like thunder and rumbled through the mountains. He didn't know what phase of the battle he was currently in, but he was determined to help the freezing people. The guy wanted to carefully descend the cliff, but his foot slipped and he started flying downward. Flying a few meters, Zeke hit the ground and coughed. His eyes got stars in his eyes, and his mind thought something had gone wrong again. But it was a good thing I had my weapon with me. It was a good idea to strap the shield to my arm. Zeke regained consciousness quickly as the cold snow stuck to his body. He jerked to his feet and looked around to see where the voice calling for help was coming from. The black barbed hand acted like a demon sitting in a demon. It instantly multiplied and enveloped Alex's body, thus making a defense against the chilling foam. Alex thought this time he had managed to resist. Good thing I gave my inner demon some freedom. Now it's time to use the hundred armed hands. And instantly the hundred arms began to pound into the dragon's chest. Then Alex confidently spoke while you catch your breath. I have time to prepare for a powerful demonic attack. He shouted menacingly three fists like three hundred. Hundreds of black hands immediately came out from his back. They began to weave together in three different directions at an incredible speed. The formation of the huge hands ended at 100 meters. The finger weaving technique looked different. Also hundreds of thousands of knots were tightened strongly building up the bones on the fists. Alex wasted no time in uttering an inverted swing. From the blow of incredible force, the dragon carcass went flying. Someone in the crowd of people shouted, look at the hero fighting the dragon. It seems the battlefield has moved closer to us. Zeke saw that the dragon's body had split the rock and landed in a valley a few hundred meters away from him. Then he saw a huge dark ball from which first his hands appeared and then Alex himself. Then Zeke ran with all his might towards the frozen silhouettes. He thought Sir Alex must have a high level of magic and while they are fighting, I will help people. He ran to the couple standing motionless and started to say, don't be afraid, I'll get you out now. The girl with a barely audible voice started to say, help me, I can't feel my body. Zeke decided to act and with all his might hit the ice block with his shield. Small pieces of ice flew in different directions, but the ice was so thick it didn't even crack. Then he used his feet and tried to knock it down. But this attempt ended in defeat. The girl started to say my boyfriend hasn't broken in a long time. He's already frozen to death. Please save her. The girl gathered the rest of her strength and smiled with her eyes and continued to say my end is near save at least the child. Zeke looked at the baby who wasn't even crying and started to say bear with me and I'll get you out. Then he turned the broom over and hit the baby with the hard cue thinking damn I'll have to crush the father to get the mother and the baby. Suddenly from the valley came the voice of a powerful storm demon's overturned fist. The ground shook from the heavy blows. At that moment, Zeke thought Alex will be here soon. We have to hurry to find a better place and get set up. Alex was protected by a black barbed hand with one eye watching and coordinating the attacks. But the dragon glaring with its fangs continued to fight. Then Alex noticed a weak point and with three precise blows, he broke the dragon's tail. People unable to see what was going on in the valley were gossiping about the ongoing battle. A boy who had recently lost one eye had blood frozen on his cheek. But with his other eye, he kept looking out into the valley. When he saw a bright light, he started shouting, Hero, run away from there. Our castle was hit by the same one. At that moment, the dragon struck the ground with his mighty paws, and then it was like lightning bursting out of the ground, and a blinding flash illuminated the black and white mountains. Meanwhile, Zeke poked at the ice block. He threw his whole body at it, but it wouldn't budge. He held his shield in his left hand and struck with his right. Soon spider webs appeared on the thick ball of ice. Once again, a dragon roared in the distance and Zeke's ears perked up, but he couldn't bounce back. Zeke felt a strong blow. His shield was instantly torn to pieces and he was thrown backwards. The guy with frozen blood on his face shouted for everyone to close their eyes as the winged creature decided to turn us into glass again. There were wild screams in the crowd. The king, gripped by terror, began to shout help how cold it was. Why did the darkness fall before its time? Soldiers, look for ways to escape. I was right. 
It seems the panty-wearing pervert is lost. After the bright flash, the darkness closed in, but in the valley the lightning flashed and diverged like tree roots. The dragon, standing motionless, stared at his opponent. Meanwhile, a mountain of ice was growing on its back. From the incredible attack, Alex lost his protective paw and skin. He started to say everything is happening like last time to his body, that after 20 years to go to war in young clothes, will never become a saint again. What a disappointment. Zeke landed in a compartment in the snow and lay still for a while. As his consciousness began to return, he thought to himself, it all happened so fast, but why am I still alive? Maybe it's the magic in the shield, but I'm so cold. His eyes opened wide at the growing thoughts that I must save the mother and child. Then the crying of a child was heard. Zeke looked up and thought the last thing I remember is cobwebs on the ice. The impact seemed to scatter the bodies, but the crying came from the snow pile. Zeke looked in the direction of the sound and saw that the mother had been torn to pieces, her frozen legs still in the pile, and her upper body hugging the baby lying motionless. He thought everything had gone wrong from the beginning when I slipped, and now the situation is definitely out of control because the mother is probably dead. But the baby's still alive. I have to save it. But how do I get up and why can't I feel my arms and legs? Then Zeke turned his head and saw that his arm and legs had been torn off. Pieces of a broken shield and a boot with the rest of his leg were lying nearby. Panic was growing in the crowd of people. They were screaming and crying, and some of them were looking for ways to retreat. But unfortunately, all the mountain paths were covered with snow. A guy with frozen blood on his face watched what was happening in the valley. When he saw a man crawling, he started shouting, Hero, run away. Crawl the other way or you'll be a block of ice. Zeke heard the guy's voice clearly, but he wouldn't back down. He grabbed the rocks with one surviving hand and crawled like a worm to the barely audible cries of a child. At that moment, he thought I have to save him. I'm a hero too, even if I'm overdue. But the guy kept yelling, hero, get out of there fast or get what's left of you. See, everybody's dead out there, but you can still survive. Zeke thought I can't save everyone like the other heroes, but I can save the kid. Meanwhile, Alex was getting closer to the dragon and started to say you just thought about the gear. But why do you need an ice shell if your teeth are gone? You don't know that you won't succeed because you are forever a weapon in the hands of humans. Stupid lizards. The dragon's mighty wings created a flap as if an electric shock had burst from beneath his paws and split the rocks. Blinding flashes flew out in all directions and lit up the starry sky and everything around them. Zeke heard the dragon's roar and realized it was too late to escape, so he covered the child with himself. A stream of freezing air hit the rock on which Zeke was lying but he managed to grab the child and began to fly away. After landing softly in the snow, Zeke fainted several times and regained consciousness, but suddenly he heard footsteps approaching. He struggled to open his eyes and saw that someone was covering him with a cloak. The demiurge covered Zeke and began to say you failed in such a simple task. You should have just stood there and waited for Alex to do the dirty work. Now I don't understand you at all. People are so weak, how can you beat me? You're like a candle that can be blown out. You're willing to sacrifice yourselves to save others. I don't understand how we've been losing to the likes of you for 66500 years. The strange thing is, the more I'm here, the more questions I have. Zeke cradled the child against him and began to say, Dem's name, I'm sorry I didn't find a comfortable place to sit. Then he started coughing and struggled to keep talking. Next time I'll be sure to get the job done. He wanted to say something else, but he lost consciousness and his head fell down and his face was in the snow. The Demiurge said quietly, It seems my hero has lost all his limbs, and what should I do with this piece of frozen meat now? The next action takes place a few days after the battle. Zeke began to regain consciousness. He opened his eyes and thought about where I was. Then he sat up on the bed and started talking about what happened to the dragon and Dem's Nim and why I'm still alive. Then Zeke looked around and continued to say, I'm in Dem's room, which means he saved me after all. He scratched his head and thought about what had happened because the last thing I remember was the horrible pain and the cold and then I must have passed out. At that moment, Zeke looked down at his stitched up arm and started to say, but I remember clearly that my arm was torn off at the elbow. The guy immediately threw the blanket off to the side and looked at his partially bandaged legs. He started wondering what those black stitches were. I can wiggle my toes, which means my feet have already taken root. What my body had become and how it had gotten that way. Suddenly there was a voice that seemed to be Yulgum starting to correct herself. A second voice immediately answered, and he wasn't so bad tell me. Zeke perked up his ears and thought it was Dem's voice. Then he got out of bed and started walking towards the hole in the wall while thinking how good it is that my legs are working. 
When he looked down, he got a questioning look on his face. He started to ask Sir Dems what was going on. The Demiurge was standing by a large pile of weapons. There were swords of different types, axes, rapier shields, and also many different blades. At that moment, he looked up and started to say, how good it is that you are awake. Zeke continued to ask, I have many questions. Please tell me what happened to my body. Where did the dragon go? And what happened to that child? The Demiurge didn't hesitate to answer. The dragon was taken care of and the baby was taken care of. So don't worry. It's overdue. If you've slept well, get down there and get the weapons. We got to get the store open quick. Zeke thought when I looked him in the eye, I'd be calm and said, yes, sir. I'm on my way down. That was not the end of Yulgum's appeal. For soon, the Demiurge again received a sheet with information that a new dragon had appeared. So the team immediately went to the address. Soon the city was visible in the near distance, smelling of gore and corpse stench. The horses snorted and sped forward. Zeke sat motionless, staring at the perishing castle, seemingly overwhelmed by confusion and horror, and sagging beneath the dragon's clutches. The agonizing fear and doubt surely passed to Zeke. His heart constricted, and time seemed to stand still. They were late, and late was worse than never. The Demiurge began to speak, so here's the plan. While the dragon hunts the humans, we get as close as we can. 893 broken goods must always be on guard. This time you've got to get it right, so don't let me down. Zeke shouted, I'm ready, Sir Alex. Let's try to save as many people as possible this time. Alex created a dark ball and silently walked into it. A few seconds later, the black ball appeared high in the sky, and suddenly the demon came out and directed the trajectory of the fall on the dragon. The purple mycelium saw Alex and immediately transmitted a signal to his brain. So the fire dragon immediately raised its head and opened a toothy nibble. Suddenly, Alex's hand glowed brightly. At that moment, the energy from his entire body was gathering in his fist. And as he approached, his eyes narrowed on his grim face and a blow of incredible force immediately followed. After a while, the Demiurge was already in his penthouse. He walked up to the ruined wall and looked down and thought that the fight had gone much faster this time. It was a good thing Alex had used top-level demonic magic. After that, the dragon was delivered to its mistress in a barely alive state. Yogam didn't keep us waiting long and rewarded us generously with money. After each victory over the dragon, we collected trophies. The next day, the weapons were already on the porch of the house. Zeke happily began to collect weapons and shouted, Sir Dems, look, there is a magical spear with a ruby tip. The Demiurge didn't hesitate and replied, well, everything is going according to plan but we don't have time to relax because I received a sheet with information that a dragon has been spotted in the warm lands. In spite of the long distance, the team immediately went to the specified address. The road was very long and torturous, and when a huge, colorful dragon appeared, they were happy. But when the fight broke out, the hero realized that it was one of the strongest dragons they had ever seen. Despite its large size, the predatory lizard was fast and used magic attacks. And so it went on and on. The team couldn't stop, there was a lot of work to be done, but the generous rewards kept them going. The next time Demiurg received a letter with information that a cave dragon had devoured all the gold miners. So he went there and ordered his team to join the fight. A few days later, Demiurg received the letter, but he was not going to waste so much time on the painful journey, so he gave the horses magic powers. Soon, they were making their way along the bare, steep slopes of the mountainside. When the land ended, the horses pulled the cart through the air keeping as close to the edge of the tangled highlands as possible. A few minutes later, they saw a whole flock of dragons flying over the blue life lakes. After the fight, they went straight to Zeke's restaurant. Today, a lot of people had come to eat noodles. They were happily chomping and praising the chef. Demiurge and Alex got their food and started aggressively shoving pasta into their mouths. After a few minutes, the plates were empty. Then Demiurge looked at them with a grateful look and started banging his empty plate on the table. Zeke thought, since we've known each other, they've been acting strange. They feel no fear at all during battle. It must be that beastly appetite that keeps them strong. He smiled and began to say, wait a little while, I'll make a refill. Zeke cooked the pasta and placed it on the table. The Demiurge immediately grabbed the plate with his hand and began to devour the food. A leaf flew in on the warm summer air and fell into his plate. The Demiurge, with his mouth full, started to say this message from Yulgum. Alex, hurry up and harness the noble steeds. We need to head to the island in Cinerir. Soon the team was loaded onto the wagon. The horses shook their heads and roared as if they heard the call of the battle trumpet and spurred forward. Their hooves threw sparks and the night parted around them. A few hours later, they saw a dragon flying high over the island and suddenly folded its blue wings. As it drew closer to the city, 
It let loose an aimed stream of fire, but the strangest thing was that the tubular bones flowed from the outside of his body. The demiurge was slowly falling asleep, and it seemed to him as if he and Zeke were sitting motionless as statues on a stone horse statue, while the ground was being carried away from under the horse's hooves in the sound and whistle of the wind. Zeke realized that the fight was about to begin, so he silently took his shield and his holy broom. He calmly waited for the right moment and jumped off the wagon. The dragon immediately oriented itself and saw the flying hero, so its eyes flashed red and its jagged maw opened. The sea dragon that was spotted over the blue life lake opened its predatory maw at the sight of the flying menace. Its double mandibles began to move and its gills expanded at that moment. Zeke holding his magic shield in his hand overcame his fear and attacked the cave dragon, but the ravenous beast oriented itself in time and began to release a jet of fire. With each new battle, Zeke got better and better at it. Now his magic broom glowed brightly, he followed each flap of the dragon's wings and began to strike with precision. The battle that took place in the warm lands lasted several hours, but in the end, the multicolored dragon took a lot of damage and succumbed. The battle that took place on the island of Cinerir was brutal and fierce, but short. The dragon covered in tubular bones was foolish. It missed a few hard blows on its krills and unable to take off, it was soon defeated. The hard battle that took place over the Blue Lake of Life lasted a whole day, for the sea dragon managed to hide in the water. But the hero lured the dragon out with magic and soon defeated it. Gold coins and weapons appeared on the porch of Dem's house the day after each victory. Zeke, as promised, listened to his master and tried to follow him in everything he did. The fight that took place in the cave also ended in a hero's victory. Zeke, covered in blue blood, left the scene thinking, I am much more experienced now. Every punch I threw was accurate, but why was that stupid dragon sitting in a cramped cave? When Zeke returned from his mission, people looked out of their windows and shouted with joy, Hunter who saved our village and Doria Castle next door, you were sent to us by God. A girl put her breast through the window and shouted, Handsome boy, come to me tonight. But the hero did not pay attention to the people and went to the demiurge who praised the hero. Zeke and his team became the most famous in the area before they knew it. When the team returned to their native Zorix, the demiurge began to say that it was really done. I didn't think such a small thing could take so long. Alex, with a satisfied look on his face, answered our first branch of devil weapons and the store is ready to open. My lord, come inside. I really hope you like it. The Demiurge walked in energetically and saw a sword with a large purple stone on the wall. He began to say this is nitrogen, and inside this crystal is a demon prisoner, and this sword with the yellow crystal is emitting aura light. I must have seen this sword in Tacoma's castle. Zeke started talking. This place is full of magical weapons. Look at the sword with the green blade. It's a one-handed legendary sword forged from dragon steel. I think it could easily cut through a dragon's scales and reach its heart. The Demiurge began to speak. This is the citadel of the God of Death. I didn't realize it would look like this inside. I see you did a great job. Alex briefly thought about it and answered that our store is not comparable to any other in the neighborhood or neighboring cities. The Demiurge's face became mysterious and he started to speak. But I don't care because you will run the business. Alex answered as you say, my lord. But you see how cool it is here and we did it for you. Zeke asked what you will do, master. The Demiurge didn't hesitate to answer that you have ever seen owners working. You know how that sounds. He laughed happily and hugging his guys began to say, I want to be rich, not work. I think my men can handle such an easy task. After that, he pressed the guys to himself and continued to say, If you don't like something, then pretend that you want to work here. Alex replied, I agree. Zeke trying to take a breath started to say, Okay, but let me in. I don't have enough air. Demiurge started to say, if the issue is solved, you can start to make the store to everyone's liking. You can divide the work, let one do the orders, and the other one come up with the prices. Zeke started to say, can I go to the stables after my shift? I have to pay for my younger brother's schooling. The Demiurge immediately said, I don't care. Do whatever you want. You and Alex are in charge here now. Just make sure our weapons aren't stolen. After that, he looked at Alex and continued to say, bring what I asked for. Alex walked over to the table and threw down the blanket. Everyone looked at the item they had bought. Zeke started saying how cool it looked. This magic shield must have been made years ago. It's like it's looking at me, and you think it was used by a sorcerer before. The Demiurge took the shield and scrutinized the hieroglyphics. Then he began to speak. I don't want to puzzle out a whole description, but one word I understand the name of this shield is Dumsligan. 
I know that this shield of the season was forged by the best blacksmith of the dungeon Hermes, from scales collected on a dragon hunt, combining blue darkstone and scattered scales. Then Alex started to say the shield could repel three or four attacks from the demon king under the dungeon. He meant the underworld, but Zeke thought it was the dwarves. So he starts saying it's incredible that the shield can even deflect a demon king's attacks. The dwarves know what they're doing. The demiurge started talking about expired merchandise. Hold this and toss the shield to Zeke. As soon as Zeke touched the shield, he was immediately plunged into impenetrable darkness. Suddenly, it was so quiet that he could hear the rapid beating of his heart. He found himself weightless, and his hair stood on end in fear. Then Zeke, in a trembling voice, began to call out for help from the demiurge. At that moment, a crackling sound was heard in the impenetrable darkness, and small sparks of light began to appear. A chilling voice sounded, You mighty warlock! Zeke flinched and stammered and began to answer, I am human, please tell me I'm dead. The powerful voice whispered in his ear that you were human and you chose to summon me. Zeke saw a one-eyed tall tower looking down and realized he was heading into a black window. A low and velvet voice came from the oval pupil. My name is Dumsligan, and I will serve your master until the last flame of life. What's wrong? He asked reproachfully. You have to bother me about nothing. There is truly no rest day or night. Zeke realized that he was already sinking into the pupil and began to say with a shudder, Sorry, Dumsligan. I didn't know it would make you angry. Suddenly there was a crackling sound and something shiny flew near Zeke's temple as if it had hit a wall. The space shook and the shiny ball spat out a fiery sheaf of lightning. At that moment Zeke felt the Earth's gravity and that he was on his feet. Only his legs were shaking. He had a frightened look on his face and began to say, where did Mr. Doomsley Gun go? The Demiurge began to say, He'll be here in a minute. If you don't want to be blown to pieces, you better deflect the blow. After saying that, the Demiurge started to make a magical strike. Meanwhile, Zeke got into a fighting stance and clutched his shield with both hands while kicking hard with his legs. Suddenly, Doomsley Gun's eye glowed and absorbed the magic ball. At first, Zeke felt a vibration and his legs gave out but when the recoil hit him, he started flying backwards, knocking everything in his path. Alex saw it and immediately started shouting who would level his own store with the ground. The Demiurge calmly replied it was just a test, just a little test. At that moment, Zeke broke through the wall and was already in the next room and rolled on the floor. The main wall shook and covered Zeke with debris. The Demiurge continued to say he was not torn apart, which meant the shield was working. Zeke crawled out from under the rubble and cheerfully began to say, great shield. Then he looked around and kept talking, and I didn't even realize I was outside. I think even an A-ranked hero, no G-ranked hero, would want to buy it. You saw the incredible power I had because I regrouped. I just put my shield in front of me and broke through the stone wall. The Demiurge didn't take long to reply that if it was 100 times bigger, I wouldn't believe it would deflect my spear. It is useless to me, but you may need it, so accept this humble gift from me. Zeke stood still and tried to collect thoughts in his head. After a short pause, he asked what you were talking about. Then the Demiurge repeated, I'm giving you Dumsligan. The guy opened his mouth in surprise and after a few seconds began to speak, Mr. Dems, you mean it. I thought that only a powerful warlock could actually use this shield. The Demiurge began to explain the shield can be used by anyone. And since you are so weak, you need powerful equipment. We'll take it one at a time, so we'll start with the shield. Zeke turned the shield over and looked appreciatively at its hieroglyphics. Suddenly, tears sprang from his eyes. Then he looked at the Demiurge and began to say, You're giving me a cool shield, even though I'm only rank P. Please tell me you don't feel sorry for it at all. To which the Demiurge replied, I told you that this thing is useless to me. Then Zeke hugged the shield and began to sob loudly. When he calmed down a little, he began to speak, I never dreamed that I would be holding such an amazing shield. It's the best in the whole world. The Demiurge looked at Alex and started to ask what was going on with our hero. Alex briefly thought about it and answered, I don't know. It's the first time I've encountered such a thing. Then the Demiurge looked at Zeke and began to say, Silly, and why are you crying even though I have not offended you in any way? The action takes place elsewhere in the kingdom of Verde. In Tacoma's castle, there were many people gathered drinking, eating, and having a good time. Now the castle belonged to a gang of thugs and a pathetic thug. The leader looked greedily at his fingers covered with gold rings with shining gems and began to say how much you have collected. But why do you need so much? You can't save it all before you die anyway. The old man is unconscious, and as far as I know, no one has ever gotten up from the dead. 
so we can take the gold for ourselves. Then he hugged the lifeless girl and continued to say, I'm right, Princess April. The princess lowered her head, kneeling beside the royal throne. The leader licked his lips and shouted, Drink to your heart's content. I allow you to do whatever you want. The people raised their wooden cups and started shouting praises to the new king. Suddenly, the large wooden door opened ajar, and through the crack, an unknown hooded guy walked in carefully. He took a few steps forward and began to look at the floor. Then the guy slowly walked towards the stairs, looking around. The people sitting at the table that was bending from the food immediately noticed the stranger. The guy sat down at the foot of the stairs and touched the floor with his hand, and without a moment's hesitation, began to climb the stairs. When he reached the second floor, he leaned silently against the wooden railing and looked at every crack. Then he approached the drunken bandit, looked at him, and silently went to the third floor. The bandit turned his head and, trying to concentrate his gaze on the stranger, began to say, Why are you staring at me like that? Maybe you want to punch me in the face. Then he decided to stand up, but lost his balance and fell off the chair with a clatter. The bandits below held their breath and looked in the direction of the rumble. A guy hiding his face stopped near a stone column, and suddenly a low voice rumbled, which seemed to be happening here. The guy moved forward confidently and did not pay attention to the bandits who were already drunk and lying on the floor. It was as if he was following the route he had been given, carefully avoiding the people. Suddenly, the guy sat down and began to talk. So from the castle gate to this place, there is no sign of resistance. It seems the people didn't have time to prepare for such a sudden attack. The leader of the gang of thugs started to say, who the hell are you? The guy calmly replied, oh yeah, no one pay attention to me. Then the leader starts asking what you're sniffing around for. You think I don't know you're looking for hidden treasures. 978. The boy smiled and immediately answered why I need treasures that can fall apart like a crystal ball in an instant. But I see that pride and malice have taken their toll and the unarmed men are at the mercy of robbers and plunderers. The stranger realized that there was nothing to do up there and started talking. He jumped like this. The people immediately raised their heads to see the guy heading towards the throne. After a moment, he was in front of the throne and continued talking. He also landed like me right here. Before his eyes was a king in a golden crown. I think the wise king sensed the prophetic fear and tried to bribe the attacker, but something went wrong. And then the explosion followed. The puzzle seems to be coming together a little bit. The leader sitting on the throne began to say the outlaw's life is now in the past. See, Princess April is mine now, which means I'm in charge. The guy ignoring the extraneous sounds started muttering he broke through the mountain with a single blow. How could a man do that? I think it could have been done by a far-sighted king of antiquity. He used a dangerous weapon with properties beyond our comprehension. However, the power of antiquity has not yet disappeared from people's memory. The leader looked menacingly at his men and shouted my servants, I order you to disembowel this miserable lost creature. The guy immediately turned and put his hand forward and began to say, Don't move, it's dangerous. You may be the cockroaches that flooded this place, but your life is still valuable. The bandits overturned the tables with food and got up, pulling out their weapons and preparing to execute the order. Someone in the crowd shouted, He's crazy, kill him, and the problem is solved. But the guy closed his eyes and as if repeating a poem only in an unknown language, his index finger moved as if drawing a charming picture. Then he opened his eyes and started to say, stop, we are all God's creatures. But the bandits were running towards the target with their swords flashing. And then a terrible sight developed as magical blades appeared and chopped their legs. Everything happened so fast that they did not even have time to orient themselves and only one by one fell face down. Thick red blood poured down the stone floors. Wild screams mingled with desperate squeals. Then the guy looked at the others and continued to say, Don't move or repeat the fate of these ones. The leader of the brigands bared his teeth and began to say it was magic. Who are you and why have you come to us? The guy raised his hand and pointing his finger upwards began to answer, If you don't want to lose your second eye and plunge into eternal darkness, you'd better cooperate with us. You see, the people upstairs are worried about what's going on. It seems something bad has happened here. That's why I've been sent to investigate. So I suggest you call off your dogs. The leader shouted angrily, Don't even try to intimidate me and tell me who sent you. The boy briefly thought about it and replied, Maybe you've heard of the representatives of Mr. Sanctus Maximus Populi.